See, I think I skipped, yep, I skipped one plan. So this is looking, because all the employers are separate, um, you can see this distribution of, of the number of, of plans and the funded percentage in that distribution. You get, it's, it's a pretty uh, obvious bell curve. You can see our plan is, is as we go forward uh, with that consistent pay down of unfunded liabilities and helping employers find solutions on their own to pay it down quicker, moving that the middle of that, that chart more to the right to 100% funded status. Um, this is looking at 165 different employers 73% have a funded status of at least 50%, um, but that leaves a significant number of 61 employers below that 50% funded. Um, this is not a weighted average, this is just for the number of employers. In terms of the contribution rate history, uh, this is the inverse of the funded status. The funded status as it was going down over time, obviously the contributions have to increase to make up for, for the unfunded liabilities. And you can see that definite trend 2011 through 2018. The good news is it has stabilized uh, over the past several years. So again, we're getting more on that certain path about how we're gonna pay down the unfunded liabilities and not let that hole continue to get, get larger. Again, the, the, every plan is different. Here's a distribution showing those contribution rates. Um, and this is, again, works just the opposite of the funded status. That, that bell curve shape that you see, we want it to move more to the left, more towards the lower percentage for contribution rates. This is for tiers one and two only, as tier three maintains that 50-50 that split between the member and employer contribution rates. For the corp fund, here's the funded ratio. Uh, again, definite trend of the decline over the years. And over the past uh, three years, you can see how it's stabilized. There still has been a slight decrease uh, for the past couple years. We do know there, there have been some uh, sizable salary increases for, correction, uh, yeah, for corrections officers that are increasing the future liabilities for those members. So um, that was a driver in the, the small decline that we saw in the funded status for Corp but those types of uh, salary increases are not anticipated over the long term. So we should start to see this, uh, actually the funded ratio start to increase over time. The funded status ranges, um, you can see the, not as many employers, it's hard to get more of that bell, that bell curve uh, perspective, but you definitely, definitely see there in the middle, those 18 of the 28 employers between 50 and 70% funded. So there's a significant portion there that we really do need to work with. Again, finding those solutions and that consistent path to get moving them to the right more towards that 100% funded status. The contribution rates uh, for the uh, different court plans. Uh, these, these rates uh, reflect only the court DB, just the defined benefit portion. Uh, corrections uh, defined contribution only plan was established in July of 2018. And that's the tier three portions uh, we talked about with the membership numbers. And again, we want these to move to the left. Um, some of these concerning over on the far right up to the 65 to 90% uh, contribution rates that we need to work with those employers trying to find solutions to get those back in line. EORP, uh, similar pattern in terms of the funded status, those changes taking place, pension reform. Uh, you can see the past several years uh, where that, that line really has flattened out. So uh, making progress on the unfunded liabilities. That 34.3% we have in 2020 is on the pension side, that's minus the health insurance subsidy. Those three consecutive years, slight improvement, but it is moving the right direction. And again, just keep it moving the right direction. And with the changes that we've made on, on the actuarial assumptions and amortization methods, we're, we're planning to see continued progress and more certainty on those unfunded liabilities into the future. On the investment side, just a quick summary of kind of where we are. Uh, the whole purpose of PSPRS, each plan has their own liabilities. They have their own assets, but those assets are pooled to take advantage of the larger investment portfolio to get those returns um, across that broader spectrum. It allows for broader diversification. Uh, you can see the breakdown of the different asset classes 
And having a large portfolio like this allows investment in asset classes that individually those plans would not be able to take advantage of. As of June 30th, 2020, PSPRS had $10.9 billion under management. Um, and again, those break that 10.9 million, you can see the percentage breakdowns by asset class. So the performance for fiscal year 2020, as of June 30th, 2020, uh, the return for the portfolio was 0.91%, less than 1% return. That is significantly below the 7.3% assumed rate of return, but that assumed rate of return is an average over the long term. That's our target. And we do know that obviously the extreme market volatility due to the pandemic really drove that return for the end of, of, June, of fiscal year 20. The S&P 500 index dropped 34% in March from the mid-February high for the markets. And looking across the uh, public pension spectrum, the middle of the road fiscal year 20 returns for U.S. public pensions was 0.8% for those plans with more than $10 billion under management. So you can see how that 0.8% average relates to our 0.91% return. Uh, for that fiscal year that ended June of 2020 did not capture that ensuing market rebound. And one thing uh, that we, how we like to explain this that our investment committee chair, Harry Papp is, does a good job of explaining is, those are just based on valuations at the time. Those assets were not sold. We didn't realize that loss. That was just based on the market value at the time. We held those assets and so we did take advantage of that rebound. Looking at where we are in terms of investments for the current year, how we're tracking so far, uh, since we did have that low number where we ended June 2020, we have seen significant growth for fiscal year 2021 to date. Through the close of November, the investment returns uh, were 11.85%, so almost 12%. Again, comparing that to the 7.3% assumed rate, as of the close of November, the assets under management reached 12.9 billion. That was a one and a half billion dollar increase since June 30th, since we ended June uh, fiscal year 2020 with 10.9 billion in the investment portfolio. Um, in addition to just that rebound in the markets and taking advantage of that by holding those stocks, we also had some changes to the asset allocation policy and the staff were working on rebalancing the investments. So we had some opportunistic investments to put more money into markets to get more of that rebound and take advantage of that. And we also are seeing strong performance on our private sector investments, the private equity, private credit and alternative investments. Okay. For operational updates, um, looking internally, when I started in December of 2019, the first couple months I was here, we worked on the fiscal year 2019 audit. There were some uh, internal control deficiencies that were reported by the auditors. And as a result of that, uh, we undertook a, a project to implement a new general ledger system by July 1st. So that is in place uh, for the current fiscal year. As a part of that process, we also went through a cash and contribution processing review that resulted in some changes, strengthening internal controls and, and providing documentation on all of those processes for cash and, and con contribution processing. Um, we hired new auditors, Clifton Larson Allen uh, completed the audit for fiscal year 2020. Clifton Larson Allen, they're a national firm that specialize in public pension auditing bringing a lot of expertise to the table to help us as, as we work through these changes. Uh, shortly after I started December of 2019, a few months later, I hired my deputy administrator. I hired Michael Smerick. Mike has uh, many decades experience with the state of Arizona. Uh, most recently, he was in the position of deputy state comptroller. So he is a CPA, brings a lot of state experience and brings a lot to the table for, for the internal changes that we're working on. In addition to Mike, we also hired a new CFO, John Mormon, um, our controller, Jack, Jack Jordan, who, um, and the internal auditor that we hired, also state employees. So we, we have a lot of professionalism, a lot of extensive state experience that we brought into the agency uh, to help implement the changes that we're seeing. 
Last year, we also implemented the actuarial modelers for each system. Those were put together by our actuaries, Foster and Foster. Those are available to all employers at no cost, and those include employer-specific demographic information. So every employer, they have your information. You can run scenarios to help educate uh, elected officials, management, about how your plan functions, how it operates, and what your options are. Those have been updated to reflect the new board actuarial assumptions and amortization changes. And they're also being updated for the June 30, 2020 actuarial valuations. So we hope to have those out any day now um, once we get those reviewed and finalized. There's also a new tab uh, be, that has been added to the modelers for those employers that are interested in considering pay down of unfunded liabilities, whether it's a debt financing or any other method, there's, there's you can create your own scenario and have that information available on this new tab so that you can analyze that and figure out what's right for your community as you, as you look for solutions. Continued operational updates, uh, IT security upgrades, the new IT network staff, 80% of the staff are new hires over the past two years. Uh, we have the new 24-hour security operations center, new advanced artificial intelligence protection, and in collaboration scanning with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So we're really taking the IT security needs very seriously and protecting the information for our members and our employers. This, this past summer, as happens every year, the state has the Employee Engagement Survey conducted by ADOA. For PSPRS, our overall agency score improved to 88% from 73% in 2019. That exceeds the state average of 74% across all state agencies. The increased engagement and satisfaction uh, did increase in all 14 categories that were measured. And the one that I think I'm most proud of is the results of the survey showed a 31% increase in staff who would recommend PSPRS as a good place to work, up to 87%. So just working backwards on that math shows that last one year ago, that was 56%. So roughly half of the staff felt that way to where now we're approaching 90%. That's a huge improvement, something I'm very proud of. Continuing these operational updates, the investment opportunities and allocation. Again, the, the revisions to the asset allocation, the greater allocation to domestic stocks, take advantage of that growth opportunity, buying of distressed assets at a discount. Um, this is the opportunistic investing that I was speaking to with the downturn in the economy due to the pandemic. Um, pen public pensions are in a unique situation with Throughout the year, the contributions from employers and employees continue to come in. That, that puts us in a positive cash flow situation. Other institutional investors do not have that opportunity to maintain reserves or other needs they have for cash flow purposes. They're faced with having to liquidate investments in a down market. So we're able to pick those up and, and take the opportunistic um, upside of those investments. We also have changed the asset allocation uh, with that change to domestic stocks to push the increased returns, but still keep an acceptable level of risk in the investment portfolio. Across our team, uh, there's nationally recognized investment team members and consultants uh, that we have. Um, our consultant uh, with NEPC, Alan Martin, received an award here just a couple months ago, uh, recognizing his work within the public pension space. And our investment team has been recognized the past two years for uh, private equity returns um, over a five-year horizon. The, over this past year, the, the Board of Trustees adopted the actuarial changes to eliminate the negative amortization. This was a big step. Um, it is being phased in over several years, but our actuary uh, did mention that this really is a historical change for long-term plan sustainability and lower employer costs over the long term. Again, this is those steps being taken to stop make stop growing the unfunded liabilities and taking steps to try to pay that down over a more consistent and certain time frame. Um, the advisory committee worked. Uh, we re-engaged the advisory committee. They had not met for some period of time. Uh, the advisory committee is there for ongoing stakeholder engagement through the member through the, the members of the committee, which include employers, members, and retirees. So I'll go a little bit deeper in the advisory committee. Uh, the employers have representatives for the League of Cities, the County Supervisors Association, 
the fire districts and uh, the state. The members, we have uh, representative from all the member groups. We have uh, law enforcement, fire, corrections, elected officials, and then we also have the retiree representative who actually serves as the chair of the committee. During this last year, uh, what the committee had worked on, they put together the nomination list for the Board of Trustees ninth seat that was forwarded onto the Board of Trustees and then ultimately on to uh, the governor for appointment of that seat. They act as liaisons to facilitate those ongoing communications between all the stakeholders to provide input, uh, keep up communication between the system and the board. The first example of a project that the advisory committee worked on were the actuarial changes. Uh, we worked on that multi-year approach to phase in payroll growth and amortization of unfunded liabilities. And that, uh, that recommendation to the board had unanimous support from the advisory committee. The recommendation was adopted by the Board of Trustees, again, by unanimous vote in August of 2020. That was uh, actually a really good process, got buy-in from everybody, um, everyone was heard, and everyone had uh, really came out for a win-win about how to move forward with those significant changes. For the next year for the Advisory Committee, their work plan, uh, right now the Advisory Committee is working on uh, actuarial funding policy revisions that will include the board adopted changes. It will include uh, changes to align with the Arizona revised statutes that, that most of which uh, came in, the changes came into play with the pension reform. And then also inclusion of new tier structures and other clarifications suggested by the actuary. So really to create that policy document for guiding decisions into the future. Healthcare insurance options for retirees. Um, there's some expertise on the advisory committee in this, this area. So we wanna look at the health insur healthcare insurance options. It, do we have the best options? Are there other alternatives or options that we should be considering for our members? Uh, consideration of asset allocation pools based on different demographics. We have, as, as we talked about, there's different plans for every employer. Um, all of those have different demographics. Should we be looking at the asset allocation pools and how we're managing assets for those plans differently than the way we've been doing it historically. Cons uh, we're also looking to consider revising plan segregation of pension and health subsidy reserves. The health insurance subsidy is actually peeled off. So even for one employer, they will, um, for an example, city of Flagstaff fired, they will have a pension reserve and they'll have a health insurance subsidy reserve. Um, that's necessary for GASB reporting but how we manage that and, and how we keep those segregated and in, in to what extent they need to be segregated is something we're gonna look at moving forward. Um, again, one of the objectives for the advisory committee and in, in the statute that created the committee was to have them facilitate the employer member communication of the, the board topics so that we have that input, the transparency that we need for the system. Uh, we're also, uh, the last topic that was added uh, for the work plan for the next year was consideration of clarifying legislation regarding the board, board nomination and appointment process. Um, this was put in place through pension reform. So this is something that's fairly new. We just wanna look and see, is there a better way to approach it or anything we can do to make it more efficient uh, for future nominations. As I talked about with employer education, this was really one of my priorities coming in and taking this job, that employer education and outreach um, so that the employers understand their plan, how to manage it, what the needs are. And unfortunately, we had the pandemic come across, uh, come upon us this past year that we're all having to deal with, but that also created an opportunity in terms of really low interest rates. And so that makes the financing much more attractive. Um, we're also part of that education process is, is educating them on the availability of different options. Pension obligation bonds um, is really some of, some of the employers have considered pledged revenues, a pledged revenue obligation, and then others have, have looked at certificates of participation. Um, in addition to those debt financing alternatives, there's other options out there. I know the city of Prescott had put in place a sales tax to pay down unfunded liabilities. And on that note, uh, February 10th at the GFOAZ conference, 
uh, th there's a presentation. Rick Tatter with the city of Flagstaff and uh, Mark Woodfill with the city of Prescott are gonna give a presentation on what their communities have done. City of Flagstaff went through a debt financing and the city of Prescott put in place a sales tax to pay down unfunded liabilities. So a couple of really good options. Uh, again, different solutions, different communities. It needs to work for your unique community. But really these last two bullets is really what this is all about is, is getting those unfunded liabilities paid down, securing the pension benefits for the members and looking at opportunities for sub substantial taxpayer savings over the long term. Uh, continuing that, that trend, the chopping down the mountain, these are the employers that have taken advantage of debt financing so far this current fiscal year. Uh, you can see the employers there and the amount uh, of the debt financings and the projected present value savings uh, based on projected future contributions and uh, how those are offset with the debt service payments. So in terms of an operational summary, um, we've worked on engagement communications with employers, uh, support for the actuarial changes, employers finding solutions, the new management, significant state experience, professionalism that we're bringing to the agency, new auditors, the actuarial changes, um, those structured changes to inform better decisions, eliminate negative amortization. And again, this last bullet, the pension reforms are in place. It, it will take time, that shift's gonna take time as uh, employees from tiers one and two retire, the tier three, group is gonna grow. You can see the assets for fiscal year 2020 were almost $50 million when only a year earlier, it was less than 20 million. So significant growth in, in how that plan is really evolving. So to summarize where we are after this first year, um, again, going back to the words of Will Rogers, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. The pension reform put those changes in place to stop growing those unfunded liabilities the elimination of negative amortization to stop digging the hole and really put us on a consistent path to start paying those down over time. We work to change the structure, the culture and the policies within PSPRS to provide understanding of what's needed and continue to fill in those unfunded liabilities. And really the most important one really, uh, I think of what was needed was rebuilding the trust and the relationships with all the stakeholders to get PSPRS back on track, um, trying to find solutions in to fill in that hole of the unfunded liabilities. So with that, um, let's check to see if we have any questions. Yes, Mike, with a few minutes left in questions, we have one question that's coming over uh, online here and the asking, uh, uh, the question here is what do you attribute the dramatic rise in PSPRS engagement survey results uh, during the, uh, the COVID period? Um, I think there's, a, there's several things that, that come into play. Um, obviously there were some issues with previous management and some, some actions the board of trustees had to take, but we have really rebuilt the team. Most of the management team are new, only been here um, one or two years. Um, we are not tied to the old ways of doing business. We're willing to listen to new ideas, figure out what we need to do. And um, really the, really embracing um, the mission of PSPRS and what we're here to do. This is, this is something that really has an impact across the state of Arizona and really uh, focusing on that in communicating that to the staff, that what we're doing really does make a dis difference and we can have an impact over the long term. We can make the communities better. We can make a difference for our members to make sure the benefits are there when they're due. Question number two, how do we access our actuarial modeler? There is a link um, on the PSPRS webpage, uh, we do put out uh, an email to the membership through our regular emails that go out so that the request can be emailed in to get access to the modeler. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 
That's great. Are there any more questions? With that, we'll be taking a short break. Morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our annual employer stakeholder event. Really pleased that you're able to join us, albeit virtually. Obviously, we miss seeing you in person and hope that next year we'll be able to gather together and spend some time, again, talking about what's been going on at PSPRS. As you heard earlier from Mike, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I'm going to take a few minutes here and and share my perspective as a member of the board to some of the issues and ideas and objectives that not only what we've been working on, but probably more importantly, what we're, we're gonna be working on over the course of the next year. <clears throat> Again, the attendance is fantastic. We have over 400 attendees registered for the conference. And specifically today, we have apparently over 200 people actually watching us now, which is great. I wanna encourage you to be interactive and ask questions through the, the mechanism available online. Most of you that have heard me speak before clearly know I don't have 35 minutes of material and a big part of this is interaction and engagement with our audience. So I know it's harder to do virtually, but please don't be shy about asking that question so we can engage it. Most likely if you're thinking of it, so is somebody else who's participating as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the trustees. I think it's important to, to kind of level set, you know, our experiences and our perspectives on this. We're going to talk about some of the issues that the, we've dealt with as a board. And then we'll talk about some of the, the key decisions that we made. And as I said, most importantly, want to give you a sense of the things that, that we're working on. One of the things that you gathered from, from Mike's presentation is, is truly the change that's going on here at the system on all levels, whether it's at the board, or administratively, or even our engagement with the stakeholders. It's a lot, of, a lot of work and something that we're very, very proud of. And you'll continue to hear that theme in my presentation and throughout all of those today. No matter what the area is, quite honestly, I feel like we're really making a lot of headway, whether it's investments or operationally, and the list goes on and on. So a little bit about myself. I was fortunate to be appointed to the board back in January of 2019 to, to serve a five-year term. Um, and then a year ago, January, I was uh, appointed the chair and I'm currently serving in that capacity today. Um, so I've got three years left on this term. And, you know, as you, as you go through your term, it's almost halfway over, but I'm really proud of the work that we're, we've done and as importantly, the plan that we have ahead to, to continue the good work. If you just take a look as a reminder, kind of where, where we sit relative to all the pension systems across the state, we here at the system really manage three pension systems, <clears throat> the core PSPRS system, the Correction Officers Retirement Plan Corp, and then the Elected Officials Retirement Plan EORP. And obviously we have our, our brother to, to the West, ASRS, and then Phoenix and Tucson have their own non-public safety uh, single employer plans at their level. So just a little bit of perspective about how PSPRS sits into the bigger um, statewide a or retirement systems. And I think one of the things that's important is, you know, we try to, you know, keep our eyes and ears on what's going on and not only with ASRS, but other plans across the country. I think it always adds a good dimension to, to what we're doing and what we're thinking about. A lot of us are dealing with the same types of issues uh, within the state and across the country. In terms of uh, PSPRS, um, we are the plan for all public safety employees. So whether they're for state work for state agencies, cities and towns, counties, fire districts, or tribal communities. In addition to the DB plan I just described, we also do a lot with uh, defined contribution plans. Brian Moore, one of the trustees, will be behind me on my session today, <clears throat> going into much more detail about the different plans and the ongoings of those plans. And then, as I said earlier, we have the uh, cor or corrections officers as well as the elected officials plans that we're responsible for here at PSPRS. Migrating, talking a little bit, a little bit about the board. It's a nine-member board, uh, formerly seven members. So back in the reform in 2016, we uh, part of the legislative changes there was not only to increase the number of the board, but as you'll hear about in a minute, we changed some of the requirements and the appointment process is for the nine members. Uh, basically, what we have right now is, is two law enforcement reps or trustees, two firefighter trustees three members representing cities and towns, 
one representing counties, and then one that's appointed by the governor um, through the trustees, which really originate, as Mike talked about earlier, from, from the advisory committee. Uh, currently, uh, this in January, we had five trustees terms who were up. Um, two have been replaced and three uh, reappointments are making their way through through this process. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But that's a little bit about who we are in terms of structure. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about in a minute about who we are sort of as people. Here's the list of what the qualifications are for the non-PSPRS members. So somebody such as myself. And again, this, this came about as part of the um, reform in 2016. Uh, try to add some uh, variety and uh, perspectives on the board, um, sort of ensuring that people are coming from different backgrounds to share their perspective and serving as a, as a trustee on the board. So here's who we are as people. Um, we've got myself as the chair and Harry Papp as the vice chair. Harry's also uh, chair of our uh, investment committee. You'll hear more from uh, Harry in the last couple sessions today and then the other uh, seven members. And included in the material here is a little bit about their backgrounds. And I just wanna kind of touch on each one of them, uh, but I wanna start with the two new trustees, um, both Nate and, and Darren. They just joined us at the last uh, January meeting and we're excited to have them on board. I spent some time talking to Nate yesterday on the phone. Uh, Nate comes to us from the Tucson Fire Department and with a lot of experience there on, on various levels being involved in a lot of labor uh, activity down in that part of the state. And as he and I talked, I think one of the things that I'm excited about is that he is from the Tucson area in the Southern part of the state. And, and I think, you know, uh, we're very focused on communication and outreach and having a presence down there for lack of a better word, I think is gonna be very helpful for not only the system, but the board. And I, and I look forward to working with Nate uh, and at the beginning of his five-year term. And then similarly with Darren, he and I've had a chance to talk a couple of times, Darren. Darren works for uh, Phoenix Police, which is the biggest the biggest plan in the system. Makes sense that they're represented, um, and Darren has, has served in some administrative roles there. And I think he's going to be a good addition and add a, add a good perspective to the board. We look forward to, again to having uh, Darren join us. As you kind of look through the the three or four slides here we have on the trustees, the one thing that stands out is the is the diversity of the experience and the length of it. Um, we have. The minimum, I think, is 20 years experience doing whatever the retiree or the trustee does to our elder statesman, Harry Papp, who's been, you know, investing money for 40 years. So I think, as I said earlier, just their ability and their experience and their diversity is actually absolutely critical. So we have Jim Amaduri and Chris Hemmen, who are uh, in the middle of their uh, five-year terms. Uh, Brian Moore, who you're going to hear later about. It. Brian has a big perspective about operational things. He's been doing this a long time. He's sort of the, the first person that a lot of the members call about what's going on. And that's an invaluable uh, asset to have, not only at the board, but within the system. I uh, can't say enough about Harry in terms of what Harry does and, and how he's leading the investment uh, component of this organization. And you'll be very impressed when you listen to Harry for a couple hours this afternoon about not only uh, where he's got the system, but his vision for us moving forward in terms of how we're investing the tens of billions of dollars that we have. Um, and Dean, again, a strong investment background, and then Don Smith, whose term just ended. But Don, you know, was part of that original uh, new makeup of the board and had to do a lot of, um, you know, new, new things to the board coming on. And we appreciate Don's service to the organization and wish him well in his quote unquote retirement. So I didn't go through all the uh, detail there of the board, but again, just to, just to underscore the diversity and the experience that we have. For those of you that you know listen to the board meetings and follow along what's going on, we appreciate that. But I think you, you get a sense of that from the, the debate and the discussion that we have on, on particular items. It is clear that we all see things at times differently, but we all share a common objective of what we're trying to accomplish, which is to take care of the members and, and the benefits that they're due. We might uh, see things the best way to do that differently, but we try to do it respectfully and in the end of the day, you know, keep in mind what our fiduciary responsibility is not only to the members, but also to the taxpayers. In terms of the logistics of our responsibilities, obviously we govern PSPRS Corp and EORP and with, with the emphasis on our fiduciary responsibilities following state and federal law. 
Um, we spent a lot of time talking about investments and asset allocation. This particular year, as Mike alluded to, we spent a tremendous amount of time on actuarial assumptions. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few more slides. Um, we set the goals for the agency, which again, I think are, are reflective of some of the success that we've had. The question earlier that Mike had gotten was, you know, what do you attribute the increase in the, in the rating of the employees about wanting to work here? And a lot of that I think is clarity coming from the board about what we should be doing and what we should be trying to accomplish. And then the staff's going out and getting the work done. And, and that's really how the system's intended to work. We deal with the budget, you know, just like most of you out there, we're starting that budget process right now, making sure we have the resources to deliver the services that uh, the members need. And then we've got to deal with the annual reports and the auditing and, and trustee Amaduri will talk about that process and the improvements we've made there. And then quite honestly, you know, hiring uh, the system administrator has, has, is a, a critical responsibility of ours. We hired Mike a little bit over a year ago. He's done a fantastic job, not only himself, but the people that he's hired and the consultants that we've hired. We have a real strong team right now that, that's sort of rowing, we're all rowing in the same direction. So um, just wanna share that perspective with you in terms of uh, some of the things that we are responsible for. And we'll share some stories about the success that we're having, not only as a board, but as the, uh, as the staff, as we go through the rest of the presentation. So a little bit about our committee structure. As I've been on the board and I've seen the evolution of this system over the last five to 10 years, I think part of the success over the last couple specifically really has to do with the success of our board and our committee structure. And we essentially have five committees, those that are listed here. We have the advisory committee, the audit committee, the defined contribution committee, the investment committee, and the operations and governance policy committee. And what we try to do with these committees is, is push the items in their areas of responsibility down to the committee and allow them to fully vet the item and the issue and then bring that back to board, to the board for policy or other action that's required. So a lot of the items that we're dealing with, they make their way through the committees over the, the time period of several months before it actually comes to the board for any kind of either feedback or decision making um, that's needed on a particular issue. But I, I think with all that we have going on as a system, um, we could not function successfully if, if this committee structure was not working really well. And so what we're able to do as board is as an issue comes to us, we will assign it to one of these committees. They'll work that into their work plan they'll take it through a series of discussions at the committee level, and then it'll return back to the board for final action. And that, that process is working really well. And we'll share a couple of stories about, about how that's worked uh, here this year. So a little bit about the committee structure. We'll go through the details of the committees in terms of what they're doing. The first one Mike talked about a little bit earlier in terms of the advisory committee. This is a committee that was uh, real important to me when I was elected chair last year to make sure that we really reactivated this committee. This committee was created as part of the 2016 reform and it was intended to serve as a liaison between the board and the stakeholders on major policy recommendations and issues. And again, um, part of what we've focused on and what we are focusing on is that communi communication and that outreach and that feedback. And this advisory committee allows us to do that on some, some of our most sensitive, um, far-reaching decisions that we make. So uh, as we went through the uh, actuarial process this summer about changing some of our actuarial assumptions, we really engaged the advisory committee and over the course of several meetings over the course of the summer, they were able to sort of get underneath the, the hood of these particular issues, come up with recommendations, the, the recommendations they ultimately made were accepted uh, unanimously by the board, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But it goes to the point of the um, process that we try to have, the, the visible, tangible, touchable process that we're trying to display as we deal with issues. Um, Kenny Timms is the, is the chair on that. Kenny spent, I believe, most, if not all of his career with, with Phoenix uh, Police, and he comes to us with a, a strong background in, in healthcare, retiree healthcare. And so one of the key issues that the advisory committee is looking at 
is, you know, what are our options for providing retiree health care? We spend obviously a lot of time on the pension side of the equation and administering the pension, but quite honestly, from a, a value perspective, you know, health care is an important part of that discussion. We have uh, health care costs as a retiree are obviously the most expensive costs you can have. And you have people who uh, have those expenses on a monthly basis. They spend a significant amount of their pension on those health care costs. And we feel like we have a responsibility as a board of trustees to make sure that we're providing our retirees with, again, the best options for them to purchase retiree health care insurance, um, not only through ASRS, but maybe there's other options out there that we can explore. So that issue came to the board, came to the system really because of Kenny and his background and him raising his hand saying, I think we need to look at this. So it's a really good example of, of how good people uh, bring good ideas to the table. And we, we thank Kenny for that. On the audit committee, this is a, a very technical committee. It, it is what it sounds like. It's about dealing with our regulatory reporting, our annual comprehensive annual financial report, and a lot of our internal audit functionalities. We have a lot of internal requirements uh, given what we're doing with investing and other things. And uh, trustee Jim Amadori has done a great job on this over the last couple of years. We've seen a, a significant improvement in the level of professionalism at the staff level here, as well as the final product. And the, a big emphasis on timeliness of, of trying to get all these reports done on time in a more timely manner, not only for our stakeholders, but quite honestly, for a lot of the cities and towns out there. As we get done with our CAF or that information, uh, you know, goes forth to not only the state, but to you at the local level to do, to do your CAFR. So you're seeing a lot of emphasis now that we've got the, the pieces in place on trying to speed up the timing of um, what we're doing in terms of finance reporting. So to, to sort of break this up, I've got a question. So I'm gonna pivot here to our uh, communications director, Christian, and allow him to ask the question. So you never know what you're gonna get here. So here we go, thanks. Scott, how does somebody get appointed to the advisory committee? Okay, the, the advisory committee uh, appointment process, that's actually a very timely question um, because uh, one of the trustees, um, Darren Wonderly, I, no, is Darren on the advisory committee? I'm scratch that, he's not. Um, the advisory committee uh, makes its way through the appointment process through the different uh, entities that they represent. So the cities and towns, for example, have one rep in the county. And so that's how that process works. I am not familiar with where people are with their terms on that. So I think probably the, the staff, Christian, I'm kind of looking at you, maybe we can get back to, to the question asker on this one and provide them with a little bit more uh, information in terms of where some of these uh, members are in their terms and how that process works. But I think to the point of the question, and I wanna come back to the advisory committee, when, when this came up through the reform, part of this was uh, intended to be, if you will, a, a potential training ground for uh, future trustees. And um, that's what was some of the genesis was that it exposes them to the system uh, on a level of, of more engagement. And again, they're advisory, so there's an even number. So they're not taking a vote looking for um, a majority to enact something. Their action is, is a recommendation to the board. So we didn't feel like we needed a, an, an odd number and we had the 10 because we have five members who represent the different five employer groups and then the employees to match that. So um, we'll get back to you in terms of the makeup and where they are in their cycle, but appreciate that question. In terms of the defined contribution committee, again, um, right now we've got uh, trustee Brian Moore who will be speaking to that point after my presentation this morning. Um, but we're seeing an increased level of activity in this uh, particular area um, in terms of contributions. And so over the course of last year, we've renewed the contract for the provider, for the educational provider. Um, and some other things, and Brian will talk a little bit about that. And so the, the DC committee is, a, uh, is made up of uh, a couple of trustees as well as some other stakeholders um, on that particular committee. And again, they are advisory to the board um, and they, they provide us the feedback on contracts and where we're headed on certain elements of, of running our different uh, defined contribution plans. The investment committee, probably the committee that gets the most attention, uh, this is again, is, is chaired by Vice Chair 
Harry Papp. Um, Harry's done a tremendous job uh, in this regard. And I think this committee, I mean, all the committees, we can talk about the, the strong relationship between the trustees on the committee and the ability of the staff. And I think it's, it's evident everywhere, but to me, this is where it's been the most evident, the quickest and had the greatest impact. Um, we have uh, Mark Steed, our CIO, and Harry and Mark staff and Alan Martin at NEPC. And that, that group of uh, people just do a tremendous job of um, explaining where we are, why we are where we are, and where they think we need to go. And obviously with the effects of COVID in the spring and you know what we needed to do to try to deal that or deal with that and position ourselves with the market and not sort of overreact, but not underreact and sort of walk that, that thin line. Um, I'm really proud of the way that Harry and, and Mark kind of led the system through, through that tumultuous time, very unpredictable time as we all know, but they've just done a fantastic job. And, and yes, the interest earnings for last year are probably some of the lowest for, that we've ever seen, but that's not only true for us, but across the country. But it's not only that, it's, it's what are we doing now and how are we coming out of that? And I'm sure this afternoon when Harry talks, uh, that's what he'll be addressing. But this is a really good example of um, the, the trust providing high level policy direction and then the, the investment committee actually going out and in conjunction with our consultants and our staff, you know, delivering on those policy objectives that we as the board have set over the last couple of years. And then the operations committee, this is where a lot of the administrative things that the system has to, has to do, such as budgeting and a lot of the local board work that we're responsible for uh, gets addressed. And it seems like this committee solves one thing and in the course of that, they identify three or more different things that they need to take a look at. But quite honestly, I look at that and, and, and think that's exactly how it's supposed to work. You sort of pull the thread in one area and, and it moves elsewhere in the organization. And that means we've got talented people looking at these things. We've got talented people that aren't accepting the status quo and they're really challenging and asking, why do we do it this way? And, and how can we do things better? As the, as the volume of, of what we're dealing with, whether it's phone calls or beneficiaries or the amount of money that we're dealing with, we've got to make sure that our internal policies can, can support that additional weight as we continue to grow as a system. So a lot of the things the operation committee is doing is sort of below the surface, sort of behind, you know, behind the scenes, but it's adding a tremendous amount, a lot of value to what we're doing. And I think for those of you that interact with the system on a daily basis, especially on the, on the local board issues and, and some of the member issues, and even our members themselves have seen a noticeable improvement in, in terms of the quality and the type of service that we're providing. And all of that is uh, as a function of the ops committee and their ability to have a lot of internal touch points that are absolutely critical to, to, to providing you know, the key services to our members. So I spent a lot of time on the committees and I did that on purpose because, as I said, when I got to that subject, that's how we get our work done. And I believe that's a strong reason why we've been successful, especially here recently between the staff that we have and the consultants that we're working with at the direction of the committee and, and, and the board. So now we'll talk a little bit about what the board's done over the last year. And then we'll talk about some of the things that the board is actually uh, working on right now and into the next year. So payroll growth, we spent a lot of time, probably about 18 months on this. Um, and I mean, talking at the board level, going to various conferences, GFOAZ, the City Managers Association, the league's annual conference, letting people know that we were looking at two things. We were gonna look at payroll growth and we were gonna look at uh, amortization. And both of these uh, issues came to us from our newly hired actuaries, we hired Foster and Foster a couple of three years ago, and again, underscores the, the, the criticality of having good consultants. But, but the actuaries brought this to us. They said, we need to do something in this regard on both of these areas. We spent some time trying to figure that out, and then we made some decisions in August to effectuate our intentions in these regards. So the payroll growth, the, the history of this is we were using a 3.5% annual growth assumption. 
And if you look back over the, the last 10 years, and again, it varied by plan, but on the average, it was 1.4%. And what that means is you're just falling further and further behind on the base that you're applying um, your contributions to, which in turn uh, cranks up your contribution rate. And yeah, we had a great recession during the last 10 years, and there's a lot of things that happened, but we're still too far off the three and a half percent, even if we had quote unquote normal economic times. So what we did in terms of, as we had these discussions, we just felt that where we were at was at three and a half percent was just quote unquote too high. It was resulting in negative amortization and it was forcing our contributions to go up and to be more volatile. And so as a board, we said, we've got to, we've got to do something. And that's part of the reason that we, we had some conversations with the stakeholders. So I'm going to stop here because I've got a question. Christian, what's that question? Chairman McCarty, could you briefly explain what negative amortization is? Yes, that's a great question. Negative amortization is when you're not paying the interest that's due on your mortgage, essentially. So if, if you're, you have a, a liability and the interest on that liability is $10 million a year, and you're only paying $8 million a year, that difference of $2 million is considered negative amortization. And then that winds up being added to your unfunded liability, in this case, $2 million a year. So at a minimum, one of the criteria that the board set was that we should at least be paying the interest on our mortgage. And that's what we mean by negative amortization. Thanks for that question. So in terms of payroll growth, we took a look at it and we were phasing this in on across the system. So in PSPRS, um, we will start walking the, the three and a half percent payroll growth assumption down by half a percent each year, beginning in fiscal year 22, 23. So not this year, but next year. And we did that mainly based on the feedback from the employers. We had the COVID going on. Um, they wanted that extra year to really get a, create a runway for this. And, and do some planning. So we listened to the stakeholders on that um, and we'll start that process July 1st of 2022. Conversely on EORP, they, we, we're, doing, we're starting that walk down sooner and we're doing that because of the stakeholders. The county association who, who is uh, a strong, they have a lot of members in Corp and EORP felt very strongly that they'd rather get started on, on this walk down sooner rather than later. So there's actually starts in July. We as the board took that as constructive feedback and we're gonna be, well, we implemented it as such. So again, we're, we're walking these rates down over a period of time. Our actuary has a session this afternoon. Brad's gonna get into a lot of the details here, but this is sort of the teaser, if you will, and the takeaway to, to, to really spend some time on that particular session. So that's where we are with payroll growth. And we did a similar thing with, with the amortization period. We have a closed amortization period which means as you get closer and closer to that last five or seven years, the, the, there's a lot of volatility if you have an, a good year or a bad year and you have less time to make that up. And we just sort of saw that as not where we wanted to be in five or 10 years. And so we've, um, we've um, made a change there to move to what's called a layered amortization over 15 years. And layered means when you close out one year and just say you have a million dollar loss for that particular year, it means you're going to spread that loss over the next 15 years. If a year later you have a $2 million gain, you're going to spread that gain over 15 years that start that next year, hence the word layered. And again, Brad can, has got some examples and, and some details there in his presentation. But what we are intended to accomplish there is to level that the spreading of those gains and losses out over a longer period of time, which essentially eliminates the compression that you see in a closed uh, year approach. So we will uh, start that process and um, work our way through uh, starting at that 15 years. I believe it's either next year or the year after. And again, Brad can, can get into the details on that. But those are two huge uh, changes to our assumptions huge in a sense that a decades from now, they'll pay dividends. And it just takes that long when you've got a system this big for those decisions to, to work through their system. We've got a couple of graphs here, again, at an aggregate level that talk a little bit about 
you know, the, the visually present the effects of, of change in the amortization period. And as we, as Mike talked about in the earlier session, please take a look at your individual plan using the modeler and you'll get a better sense of what this looks like for you. And then similarly on this side from the uh, unfunded liability, how that affects the changes that, that I've talked about. Again, this is system wide. You're talking a scale of billions, so it's kind of hard to see, but that decision is, is gonna save the system hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars over a period of time. So again, use your actuary modeler, understand what those decisions mean to you, how we walk down that payroll growth, that modeler is gonna allow you to, to see in, in real numbers for your budgeting and your community, what that's gonna look like. Got some closing thoughts here and then we'll wrap it up with, with what we're up to. As we always do when we talk, um, you know, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between what we do here at the system and what you all do there at the local employer level in terms of managing the contribution rates and managing the unfunded liabilities. Mike did a nice job earlier talking about some of the unique things uh, certain communities are doing now given the interest rate environment in terms of issuing debt and trying to uh, reduce their unfunded liability. Um, take a look at those ideas, understand those ideas. It's not a one size fits all but you've got a lot of creative communities out there now that are really you know, taking a look at that. And from the systems perspective, we support that. We support taking a look at it and we support whatever decision they make to try to address that at their particular level. So that's what this slide is all about. We've all gotta be working in this together. Our job as, as the system is to provide you information and tools about how to analyze certain financial implications of your decisions. And I think your responsibility is to, is to see if those tools and that material works for you at the local level. And, and that, that makes for a really good partnership. So I just wanna understand that if we're, if we're not giving you the material, the tools you need, let us know. That's sort of how the, the modeler evolved several years ago when we got the feedback from the stakeholders that they needed a planning tool. If we're gonna ask them to manage their system, then we just can't do it in a vacuum. We've gotta have them, we've gotta give them some tools. In terms of what we're working on, and again, this is pretty indicative of the momentum that we're, we're feeling right now as a system. Just like you, every year we're required to update our system's pension funding policy. Our, our advisory committee is in the midst of, of doing that. That'll probably come back to the board for approval here in the next couple of months. But again, I can't under, underscore the importance of every year um, taking that off the shelf, taking a look at it, and bringing it back through your legislative body. There's always something that you can tweak or another thought that it brings up to, to make that a much stronger policy that actually is, is being used in practice. As anything, we're, we always talk about interest rate assumptions. That's just, it, it's, it's inherent to what we do. Um, we've got some things going on though with tier three that came up uh, last year and we, we, we passed on these discussions, but we did identify that we needed to undertake them now. One of the things we've got going on with tier three, there's 16 or 18 entities that have unique contribution rates, employer contribution rates for tier three, and then everybody else is, is in one plan. And we're starting to see some separation between those contribution rates of those individual employers in tier three. And since tier three has been adopted, we have not as the board changed the employer and employee contribution rates in tier three, because they're the same one but we're starting to see that we need to come up with an approach and a practice by which we might make changes to that. So that's one of the things we're working on. And then as a companion item to that, we're taking a look at the asset allocation of tier three. So right now, when we get a dollar from a community, whether that 30 cents of that dollar is for tier one and two and 60 cents is from tier three, we're investing that the same from an asset allocation standpoint. Although we all know that tier three money is not gonna be spent for 20 or 30 years for that person's retirement, assuming it's not a disability retirement. So the question is, does it make sense to invest tier one and tier two money the same as tier three because the cash flow needs are different? Don't know the answer, but that's part of what, what we're taking a look at through the investment committee. We've also got some feedback as we went through the legislative process this year to, to move the stakeholder feedback to the front of our process as opposed to the end. Um, I think that was a, a very insightful observation from our, um, from our uh, partners like at the league at the county. And then the last thing that we're doing uh, based on legislative uh, action that it got approved last year 
is we're working through the process of hiring a, a firm to actually do the section 115 trust and section at a high level 116 or 115 trusts allow you as the employer to invest um, some of your pension money at the local level um, by making decisions about what type of investments you're in. In other words, you don't need to send it off to PSPRS and put it in your, your system account. You can send it off to PSPRS and we'll manage that separately as a 115 trust and you get to decide the level of risk that you want for that money that's in the 115 trust. So with that, Christian, I'll, I think I'm pretty much done other than talking about the legislative items, but I'll let's take a question and I think we're running pretty short on time as well. So question. Scott, we have an employer question. Could you speak about some of the assumption changes for uh, retiree life expectancies and other pressures on actuarial uh, uh, statistics? Yeah, I, I'll talk at high level and I'd encourage you to tune in to, to Brad's presentation this afternoon. There's probably, you know, six or eight or 10 pivotal assumption, actuarial assumptions that are, are core to the setting contribution rates and, and establishing good funding practices. We've talked about two of those today, but absolutely the question you're, ask, you're asking is, is, is a part of that. A lot of the things about life expectancy, I know that they roll out uh, different studies and different actuarial accepted tables, if you will, every so often. And I think it was the last couple of years that they actually, uh, the actuarial profession came up with a table just for public safety that's different than, you know, ASRS. And we've, we've incorporated those uh, actuarial assumptions into our system. And I think at a high level, not to overgeneralize, but um, typically police and fire tend to be very healthy employees. And so that sort of manifests itself in the need to have their own actuarial um, uh, death and uh, disability um, tables, if you will. But great question to ask Brad in more detail. He could probably tell you what actuarial statute and how that all came to be. But again, it's just one of those, uh, again, thoughts where you're continually tweaking and, and providing the best information you can because a public safety system is a different system in ASRS in terms of the demographics and the life expectancy. So appreciate that question. Christian, anybody else? Uh, not at the moment, Chairman okay. McCarty. I think uh, if I can tell time correctly, aren't we pretty much just about done? Yes, we are right, hitting so up I our- Just take the last few seconds to, to thank everybody for again, attending. I know uh, virtually you lose that interpersonal connection, but hopefully a lot of what we're talking about today. The message is really important. We're headed in the right direction. We appreciate, we need your support. We need your criticisms moving forward. That's the only way we're going we're gonna to get this system where we, we want it all to be. So again, thank you for your time this morning. And I think we'll take a quick break before Trustee Moore uh, follows me in a few minutes and talks about uh, defined contribution plans as I talked about earlier. Again, thank you and have a great day. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Moore and I'm going to uh provide today's uh, presentation on the PSPRS Defined Contribution Committee update. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been a member of the PSPRS Defined Contribution Committee since actually 2016. Uh, was brought uh, into this with a number of other folks and we'll talk about the committee makeup. But uh, in 2016, as a result of pension reform that created uh, the defined contribution component with PSPRS, I was asked to uh, uh, be part of this committee um, to structure, design, structure, uh, and implement the, uh, the PSPRS uh, DC plan. And uh, that subsequently led to my appointment by Governor Ducey to the PSPRS Board of Trustees in uh, June 2019. Uh, I've been a longtime student of PSPRS. I'm a lifelong learner, uh, been involved in a number of uh, different uh, organizations and committees and boards related to PSPRS. Um, my daytime position is um, I have 27 years of service with the City of Phoenix Fire Department. I uh, serve as a captain on a heavy rescue truck, uh, also part of our urban search and rescue team that uh, gets deployed across the country periodically for various events, hurricanes, uh, Oklahoma City in 1995, 9-11. Uh, uh, and so uh, I'm an active uh, fire captain, uh, paramedic uh, on, the, on the Phoenix Fire Department. 
Uh, some of the other uh, positions I hold, I am an elected City of Phoenix Fire Pension Board member. And that was in 2006 that I took over uh, that position. I'm one of two sworn, uh, pen two sworn members on the City of Phoenix Fire uh, Pension Board. And uh, so I have a lot of experience uh, in um, reviewing applications for disability, been involved in several line of duty death survivor benefit cases. Uh, as well as uh, processing our normal um, drop entries, exit, and retirement. Uh, out in the community, I uh, live in the North Valley, so I've, I serve uh, on the Daisy Mountain Fire District Board. I've served on that board for about 20 years now. Um, I started out there serving as just a local citizen member of the Fire Pension Board. After about three years of that, they uh, told me, uh, hey, we have an opening on the fire board, um, we'd like you to consider serving. We promise you that there'll be no heavy lifting uh, and um, not much to it. Uh, I found out quickly they lied to me. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but I really uh, enjoy it and uh, I'm glad to make a uh, big difference in the uh, uh, level of service that's provided by the great men and women of the uh, Daisy Mountain um, Fire and Medical uh, Department. Uh, another position I've held for a long time is uh, I'm vice president of uh, United Phoenix Firefighters uh, member benefits, uh, where I'm uh, very involved in um, health care issues, worker compensation issues, uh, the City of Phoenix Defined Contribution Plan, which is our 401A and 457. And uh, for the City of Phoenix, it's a nine-member public board. Um, the last few years, I've served as vice chair of the City of Phoenix uh, Fire uh, Pension, or I'm sorry, the City of Phoenix Def 457-401A and Post-Employment Health Plan uh, Committee that oversees those. It's actually uh, actually a public board. Uh, when I started in 2006, we had $500 million of employee assets. It's now grown to over $2.2 billion in employee uh, assets uh, in that plan. So uh, I consider it a, a, a gold standard plan and uh, from what I've seen across the country, we've done very well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the things uh, regarding uh, how tied in City of Phoenix uh, 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 provisions with the uh, PSPRS DC plan. Okay, uh, how is PSPRS structured in the various committees? So as you can see, we have the PSPRS Board of Trustees, a nine member board uh, with a few appointments by the governor. We have the Speaker of the House and Speaker uh, and President of the Senate that make appointments. Under that is the advisory committee, which I believe uh, Board Chair McCarty has uh, already spoke about, as well as uh, Mr. Mike Townsend, our administrator. We also have the audit committee and uh, the other committees that uh, make up uh, the uh, structure of PSPRS. We have the Defined Contribution Committee, which I'm going to specifically speak about today, the Investment Committee, and the Operations, Governance, and Policy Committee. And then from time to time, we've had ad hoc committees that uh, are uh, created to uh, 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 resolve uh, issues as they uh, come up. But uh, this is uh, essentially the, uh, the structure. All of these committees uh, have some board member uh, participation and in uh, presence and ultimately re report to the PSPRS Board of Trustees who uh, are responsible for making the, the various decisions. All right, the Defined Contribution Committee members. Uh, you have me, we have Darren Wonderly, who uh, was recently appointed to the uh, Board of Trustees, uh, Dean Chinert, a trustee, um, Brian Jeffries uh, uh, is uh, holding a firefighter position, Ryan McKinnon uh, holds uh, one of the law enforcement positions. Will Bubadas uh, holds one of the law enforcement uh, positions. Uh, and then Mike Smerick and Mark Steed. Uh, Mike uh, is part of PSPR staff. As you know, he's uh, the deputy administrator. And Mark Steed uh, is part of PSPRS staff and chief investment officer. Uh, Mike comes uh, with some background in defined contribution. In fact, that's how I first met Mike, Mike several years ago uh, uh, at various conferences uh, where I was representing the city of Phoenix and Mike was representing the DC committee for uh, ASRS in uh, the state of uh, Arizona. So uh, by joining us, he also brings some past knowledge of DC plans uh, to the uh, committee. Uh, of the original uh, committee members um, who were brought forth to put this uh, plan together in 2016, 
uh, all the, the original committee men, members have extensive experience in uh, defined contribution plan design, best practices in government, and, uh, and, and extensive knowledge in uh, developing and um, writing out competitive RFP designs for uh, consideration and selection. So uh, the, the core of the group that's with this uh, were, who are still with us uh, were there at the very beginning in 2016. And uh, we had to do this in a compressed uh, time frame. Uh, we essentially uh, had the pension reform legislation in 2016. That's, that required this uh, plan to be in place uh, by July 1st, uh, 2017. And um, so we want to, to work to get these things done. And the, the folks I am served with, uh, the original folks uh, who are still with us, uh, bring, uh, brought extensive knowledge, uh, experience, and um, background in uh, their respective cities uh, defined contribution plans. Uh, so uh, what are the duties of the, uh, of the, of the committee? Uh, so oversight of the various DC benefits administered by PSPRS. Uh, we also have not only public safety, but we have corrections uh, uh, 401A accounts. We also now have the elected officials defined contribution system. The elected officials DC plan replaced the EORP DB plan, which was closed in 2013. Uh, and then we have supplemental savings uh, uh, accounts. And then uh, we have just added uh, last year a 457 plan. Uh, to uh, our uh, plan offerings for uh, employers, employees and employers to uh, participate. Uh, when we went about putting together this plan uh, in 2016 and implementing 2017, uh, the plan design and creation was built upon NAGDA, the National Association of Governmental Defined Contribution Administrators. It is the, uh, what would be considered the premier organization for governmental DC plans uh, in the country. It's made up of both uh, industry and plan participants, as well as uh, folks that serve on various uh, boards and committees and commissions across the U United States. Uh, and we modeled uh, our plan uh, design and creation from the ground up on NAGDA's best practices. Uh, and essentially the steps that we took uh, that we had learned from NAGDA over the years was essentially getting a, having a competitive uh, RFP on a national basis for uh, 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 a consultant to help us build the plan. Uh, we then had a national uh, uh, RFP for a record keeper, and then uh, we uh, followed best practice in, uh, in governance. So uh, some of the other things as far as what the committee does uh, is uh, we oversee and make recommendations to the board on uh, the record keeper, which is currently uh, nationwide retirement solutions. Uh, our plan consultant is Sageview uh, Advisory Group, a nationally respected uh, firm who helps us review our investments uh, that we offer. Uh, and then another component of this was plan benefit member education services, because you have folks that have to make the decision on uh, whether they're going to go DC, DB hybrid, or, uh, you know, DC exclusive. And uh, we wanted to have a robust education program. It's specified in Arizona Winter Rise statute that we have to have this as well. And uh, the current uh, uh, provider of that under contract is uh, Public Safety Financial Galloway. As far as uh, investment options for members and beneficiaries, we have uh, 10 different classes of uh, categories. Uh, 10 different classes or categories of funds plus a Schwab brokerage. Uh, and that consists of about 38 different funds plus that Schwab uh, brokerage. And uh, we have target date funds uh, and various mutual, um, uh, significant number of index and fixed income funds for uh, our members to uh, choose from. Uh, the tier three public safety members who choose DC only benefits, uh, they do not uh, contribute to social security. Uh, they, uh, they have the option between the DC only or the DC hybrid, uh, which is uh, a DB plus the defined contribution. If they're in social security, they only get the DB plus that social security benefit. Uh, tier three corrections officers hired after July 1st, 2018 do not work for uh, uh, the administrator offices of the court and probation and surveillance capacity. Uh, tier three administrator officers of the court probation 
surveillance officers who choose DC only benefits and tier two public safety officers hired after uh, January 1st, 2012, up to June 30th, 2017. That makes up our tier two. It then uh, after July 1st of 2017, it's all uh, tier three. And uh, it's for those folks that are not in social security. So one of the things we also put together with this plan is that uh, four to five times a month, we found out that PSPRS members who were in drop and were exiting, did not make an election. So subsequently by law, PSPRS was required to pay out the drop proceeds uh, and it, uh, those were taxable and also counted as uh, income for the, for the year. Uh, we would probably like to say that came from the outlying areas of the uh, state where maybe they didn't have the educational uh, or peer um, knowledge of uh, what to do with their uh, assets. Uh, but what we did is that the drop balances now automatically transfer into Nationwide. Uh, they're available uh, the first week of the next month uh, after their retirement date is effective. So about one month and one week is when their uh, rollovers are uh, available. And it defaults into the uh, guaranteed interest account, which uh, we have locked in at a 2.75% uh, rate until uh, uh, 2022. Uh, also, another provision is, is that if you're in an employer plan, you can transfer your assets uh, after retirement into the PSPRS managed plan. The only requirement is to be a PSPRS uh, plan member. Okay, uh, some of the other provisions uh, who are in, within the DC plan, the elected officials defined contribution system. This uh, was established uh, for uh, both judicial and elected officials who were hired after January or elected after January 2014 as the EOR DB plan closed uh, by legislative action in the December of 2013. Uh, another provision that exists is the supplemental savings plan and investments. Uh, that's also open to members for additional personal retirement savings. And I mentioned we recently created the uh, 457 plan uh, uh, in addition to our 401A plan. And uh, this was in response uh, to a number of plans across the state that uh, didn't have uh, good governance, uh, had high fees, uh, and really didn't have the mechanism to put uh, competitive plans in, in uh, place. Uh, we have a large fire district that uh, sent us a report not long ago that our plan uh, for their, to replace their 457 plans saved them substantial dollars by opening it up to them. So that's uh, just one uh, feather that we're uh, proud to, uh, you know, report uh, in this. Okay, um, here's some of the uh, assets at this point. Uh, currently, the, uh, the plan has uh, over uh, a total balance of uh, well over $300 million. And that's important because that is kind of what our fee structure is based upon. There's essentially three main components to a successful DC plan. One is low expenses. Two is quality of an investment portfolio, and three is quality comprehensive education. Uh, with our plan, we're proud to report that we have negotiated substantial discounts and fees as our assets increase. When the plan was created with zero assets, we had 26 basis points as far as our fees. Uh, when we uh, went down from, uh, or we increased assets to $300 million in uh, October, uh, it's dropped to 11 basis points. Uh, when we hit 400 million in assets, we're gonna go to nine basis points and uh, 500 million, we're gonna go to seven basis points. Um, as I mentioned, we have a substantial uh, uh, interest rate on our guaranteed account but uh, we have uh, uh, growing balances in this plan. As I mentioned, I started with the city of Phoenix. We had $500 million in 2006, and we're well over 2.2 billion. So knowing uh, the assets going into this plan from drop, I expect uh, this plan to do substantially well and uh, have even uh, a, a better fee. So at 500 million, we're gonna be at seven basis points. That's a very, very competitive uh, uh, fee structure that uh, we've uh, negotiated. Okay, what's our current membership? Uh, the total DC plan membership is net, uh, nearing 10,000 uh, members and beneficiaries. Uh, our tier three section is growing pretty robustly and substantially. Uh, employers can join the 457 plan at any time. We have six employers that have joined uh, to date. So you can sign to see our, kind of see our numbers. Uh, we've gone from 7,900 in um, 2019 
uh, almost 8,000 in 2019 to just under 11,000 in fiscal year 20. Uh, our educational contract is with Public Safety Financial Galloway. Uh, it's a component required under state law and it's been very successful. It was done through a national uh, RFP re request for proposal uh, through a competitive uh, process where we evaluated a number of different providers. Uh, they conduct free member benefit training sessions for new hires and all tier three members. Uh, they promote monthly classes. And one of the key things I wanna also emphasize is that we, PSPRS, the Board of Trustees and the organization does not endorse any asset management companies to its membership. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're really proud about is the uh, amount of education that they do do. When we first started this, uh, we found that there was a, a, a fire district up in the uh, uh, White Mountains and no one had entered the drop. We asked why, and they said they were, in they were told that they had two choices. They could either get their drop account or the defined benefit pension payout, which is completely wrong. Uh, so one of the things that we've been able to accomplish is this uh, entire uh, educational process and uh, you know, make both participants as well as employers aware of the comprehensive benefit structure of PSPRS. So that's uh, pretty much it in, a, in an overview. So I'd like to ask if there's any questions at this point that uh, might uh, uh, you know, wanna be uh, covered. Trustee Moore, we have one question. If an employee enrolls in the DC plan, can they contribute to social security? Uh, the question is, is if the employer enrolls in the DC plan, can they contribute to social security? The answer is it depends. If the employer has been in social security, uh, then that employee is uh, uh, going to have a reduction in the amount the employer pays uh, into the DC plan. Uh, if it's a straight DC plan, they're gonna, uh, without social security, it's a 9% contribution by the employee, 9% by the employer. Uh, it would be, be reduced accordingly by the employer and the employee if, the, if they're in social security. The employer has to be a member contributing under section 218 to social security. The majority of uh, uh, employers in the state are not in social security for public safety, but there is a minority that is, and that would reduce their employer and employee contribution as well. Thank you, Trustee Moore. We are gonna take a five minute break and return with our programming. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Amaduri. I am a member of the PSPRS board, um, and I serve on the operations and governance committee, the investment committee, um, and, uh, and the audit committee. Um, the focus of, of the conversation today is really going to be centered around for the next 10 or 15 minutes here operate on the operations and governance committee. Uh, the chairman of that committee uh, was Don Smith, who is retiring after uh, working on the board for, I think, the better part of four or five years. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit about my background. I joined the board, uh, I think it's about two years ago. Um, I had asked, was asked to come onto the board uh, because of my investment and business background. Um, I started on Wall Street in the late 80s, um, so been very comfortable and familiar with uh, global capital markets. So everything from stocks and bonds to commodities to real estate to P and venture capital. So uh, initially that was the reason I was brought onto the board was to kind of um, serve on that committee and work closely with uh, the teams internally, including Mark Steed. Um, follow on to that was I, I joined the other two committees as well, um, which has been which has been helpful in terms of kind of rounding out my knowledge of the system and how it works and how it best serves all of its memberships and stakeholders. Uh, my background is largely finance and operations. I run uh, companies on three continents. And so to me, P&Ls and balance sheets are things I'm very comfortable with. Uh, next slide. Uh, PRS, PRS board, as you have heard from uh, Scott McCarty and some of the other uh, talks today, we really set up in five committees. Uh, Operations and Governance Committee is, is uh, one of those ones that's really central to an organization in terms of how it runs and if it works well. Um, uh, next slide. Um, uh, there's four of us that serve on the committee currently. Don is retiring, and so I'm sure one of the new trustees that's coming in uh, will probably join Brian Moore and myself and Chris Hemmen on the committee. Uh, next slide. 
um, the, what's the purpose? Uh, so understanding uh, what a committee does and how it uh, meshes into the board and how it interfaces with the management team, um, this committee's focus is, is largely on uh, strategic planning, agency budgeting, governance, um, accounting and actual practices, and, and we're, we're kind of the, the, uh, the step before it goes to the full board in terms of looking at all those pieces um, to see where things are at, uh, where there's additional resource needed, um, and then, then measuring that. So essentially a dashboard of how are things working and, and um, how is our governance manual, which governs the, the overall organization, interfacing? Are there areas that need to be shored up on that? Um, that's one of the initiatives we're working on currently is really looking at that governance manual, which is 80 some pages is uh, way too long. So we're in the process of making that document easier and more user friendly. Uh, next slide. Uh, current budget, obviously that's one of the things that we'll focus in on uh, important to all of the stakeholders, both the, the, the members and, and all of the municipalities that are part of the system. Um, We've, uh, we looked at that real hard over the last year and we looked in to see where we had shortcomings. Were. And in some of those areas where we obviously, Mike Townsend has built out the team is uh, obviously on the accounting side uh, with Mike Smerick and also with, uh, with John. Um, our call center, same thing, just looking at how are we, um, what, what's the feedback loop from our customers, right? When they call in and they get a question answered, are we getting those questions answered right 10% of the time or 90% of the time? you have to have a feedback loop um, so you can see that, that you're meeting the needs of those members accurately uh, the first time they call. Uh, IT and systems, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go down. Uh, obviously, network security, tremendously important. One of the areas that um, when I came onto the board that we originally looked at that we found needed uh, additional work. Um, and and uh, Mike, uh, another Mike, uh, as Jimmy has, has been focused in on that. Uh, member services, and then software development. Uh, next slide. Uh, cancer insurance program. Um, the focus of this is it's a, it's a program that we've got for the membership is how do we make sure that we communicate to those members uh, about the program and how it works um, and, and how they should interface. And then uh, we're looking currently on the operations committee are there any changes that are needed around that? Uh, Brian Moore, uh, because, his, because of his depth of knowledge has been tremendously helpful in that in terms of looking at um, how best to interface with those members and uh, making sure operations and governance committee looks at it to make sure it's actually sound. So before we propose any changes, we wanna make sure that there's money to pay for those changes and that all stakeholders are aware of, of what that impact will be over the coming months and years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the pension administration system. Uh, one of the things, uh, actually, when I took over this chairman of the audit committee about a little over a year ago, uh, 18 months ago, one of the things that we looked at was um, there's two pieces that weren't working very well. Um, one of them is the general ledger system. Uh, and then the other one, which is the overall pension administration system. So Mike and his team has gone uh, out over the last six months and really looked hard at the organization and then uh, gone into the market under an RFP. Uh, the system that we are currently working under works, um, but it, it doesn't, it's not going to meet the needs um, that we feel and the management team feels uh, will, will really uh, be robust and be able to uh, help it work well for the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 year periods. And so we're in the process of going out on an RFP right now. Um, and then the, we will begin the process uh, after that is awarded of putting that system in place. Um, it's a long process. It can take two or three or four or five years just because of the magnitude and how you have to migrate across on these systems. But um, we feel that, and management feels, this is something that is very, very important um, to our membership and to our board and to the management team. Uh, next slide. Um, internal policy development changes. Um, we've kind of looked at uh, working closely with, uh, there was an internal auditor that, uh, left for another job. So we're in the process of filling that slot, but working closely with Tim who's our compliance officer and really looking at the internal policies on everything from travel, uh, conflicts of interest, fraud, waste and abuse, um, code of conduct, vendor selection process. Um, what are they, how have they worked historically and how, how can we make them better on a go forward basis? So 
those are at various stages, um, but one of our goals for 2021 is to um, get those all tied out and in good shape to make sure there's no gaps in those internal policies. And then obviously our internal and extra girl auditors are critical to making sure that those policies, just because you write it doesn't mean it's followed. That feedback loop again is, is important that we build into the process. Um, uh, wage index, um, same thing, looking at uh, wh where those are established in terms of some of the things that uh, Scott McCarty touched on. Uh, next slide. And it, as I'm going through this, if any of the stakeholders on the call have questions, um, feel free to, to send those into Christian or others and uh, glad, glad to answer any of those, but I'll keep moving through it unless there's questions at this point. Um, again, 2020, where are we going to focus in as a committee? Um, policy development and approval, we're going to tighten that up. We're going to shorten it up and make it more uh, readable and understandable. Uh, obviously, the 2022 budget, um, the pension administration system, um, we think will be very helpful on a go-forward basis. And then really looking at the legislative proposals. Um, what do we see coming up that's important to the health of the system? Um, that we need to, to plan for on a go forward basis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, questions and comments. Um, again, operations and governance, um, the, the structure of the board is we've got it right now. We've got five, I would tell you, high functioning committees um, that do a lot of the heavy lifting, working closely with the stakeholders. And then what we do is we elevate the, the, the summary of that, if you will, to the full board. And we have robust conversation at the board level with the management team and then with all of the stakeholder groups uh, with the goal of being open, transparent, uh, making sure that, uh, that there's, there's no questions that are left unanswered. Um, any questions from anybody that's on the call about operations and governance and how we work and what we're doing? Yes, Trustee Amaduri, we have a question uh, about the increasing staff numbers at PSPRS. Could you please go over uh, how the Operations Committee uh, evaluates? So normally I'd tell a joke, but it's a little bit harder on Zoom, so <laughs> I won't tell any jokes about operations and governance, but uh, uh, sure, nobody has a question. Uh, we covered a bit of ground there. Um, Christian, anything on your side? Trustee Amadori, can you hear me? Okay, well, I, I appreciate everybody's time today. I would encourage anyone on this call to reach out to either myself uh, or anybody else on the committee if you have specific questions um, at any point in time, uh, whether you're a, wherever you're at as a stakeholder, right? Whether you're with Towns and Cities or whether you're a member, um, I'm available, Brian's available. Uh, Chris is available, as is the full board. Um, we're here to serve um, you guys, the membership, and all of the stakeholders in the community, um, cities, towns, taxpayers, uh, the whole ecosystem, we really believe, has to be healthy um, long-term for, for it to, to be a win-win situation. And that's what we're working uh, hard to accomplish. Thank you for your time today. From our break, uh, we will be hearing from Trustee Jim Amaduri again, who's going to give a update on the operations of the PSPRS Audit Committee. Trustee Amaduri, go right ahead. Great, thanks, Christian. Um, to those of you that were, were not on the call 15 minutes ago, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go over my background just a little bit in case we have some new people joining in. Um, and I do apologize, it sounds like uh, there was a question or two that uh, we were, I was not able to hear uh, on the operations and governance. So a little bit about my background again, uh, as I shared uh, with the uh, 15 minutes ago on the prior call was, um, you know, I'm a businessman. I've worked on Wall Street. I worked all over the globe for the last couple of decades, um, building and running companies from, you know, Japan to Europe to the U.S. Um, and a host of different industries. Um, but I, I really started out as a, on the money management side of the business back in the late, late 80s on Wall Street. And um, so very comfortable with stocks and bonds and uh, real estate and private equity and venture capital. So originally I came on the board to really join the investment committee to help Mark Steed and his team just have another set of eyes on the portfolio, which is obviously critically important to how the, the uh, system it does and will continue to do. And you know, how do we turn that $10 billion into 20 or $30 billion? Um, the, uh, the second role that I had was I was asked to head up the audit committee, um, which I took over about, I think it's been about a year ago, give or take. Um, the, uh, again, because of my financial background, uh, very comfortable with P&Ls and balance sheets. Um, I, I do very complex chapter 11 
bankruptcy restructures on occasion as well when I'm not running companies. So looking at an audit from a, a perspective of what are the systems, what's in place, and, and how does that interface to make sure that, that all stakeholders that look at the CAFR or any of the other reports we put out are sound and how the actuarial assumptions are sound. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, board committee, uh, uh, Scott covered this. Um, the the uh, the structure I think works extremely well. We've got nine trustees, and then we've got uh, individual committees that focus in on relevant parts of the organization. Um, obviously, audit committees focused real hard on the financials um, and controls uh, to make sure things are the way they are supposed to be. Um, next slide. Um, the, the, uh, one of the things that's interesting about audit committees is one of the things that you try and design into a system is redundancy, right? What you don't want is um, you don't want a situation where there's a problem and it doesn't have a way to surface um, and it's, it doesn't come to light. And so obviously there's the direct lines and then there's the dotted lines. Um, Tim Jackson is, is just phenomenal, our compliance officer, and I've become uh, close over the last year or two as we've been working on this. And then we had a, a great internal auditor uh, that took a, a job that was right for her and her family out of state. So that position is currently vacant. The team is in the process of filling that. But those two positions are critical to us as a committee, um, but us as a board as well. You've got to have a way in which um, individuals that are day-to-day -day in the organization, unlike board members, which come in you know, once a month, once a quarter, um, get that feedback loop in terms of um, are the, the, uh, the is the governance manual being followed or the policies and procedures being followed in terms of controls? Um, we've got, I would argue that Mike Townsend, uh, who came in last December, so hard to believe it's only been a year, uh, has done a great job of building out a team underneath him for the success, uh, including Mike Smerick, John Mormon, um, Mike Adjami, uh, just the, the full team of people, I will tell you, um, as a as a audit type person, I would put our financial team and our accounting team and our systems team up against any group in the United States, any other pension group, or even for that matter, a Fortune 500 company. Extremely careful, well run, knowledgeable, uh, straightforward people. So I think um, as stakeholders, you should feel comfort comfortable and confident that the reporting that you're getting and the feedback you're getting from the committee, from the board, and from the management team. Uh, is accurate. Um, uh, next slide. Um, the, uh, we separate, one of the things that we uh, decided to do as a board um, in 2019 was um, a, the audit committee was part of operations and governance. And quite frankly, it, it worked, it didn't work well. Um, it was, it, normally you would have those functions separated. Um, and so the decision was made in 2019 when I took over the committee to separate those two out. I think it's been a good decision. It allows the audit committee to focus on what it needs to, and it lets operations and governance focus on other issues. Um, there's uh, four of us on the committee. I chair it. Um, Dean's on the committee. Don's uh, on the committee. Um, and um, uh, we've got one vacancy that will be filled. Also, Don is, is retiring from PSPRS service. And so uh, his, his seat will be filled as well on the committee. On the committee, we look for people that have, obviously, financial accounting backgrounds, real important, because that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. So, um, you know, Chairman McCarthy and uh, Vice Chairman Papp will, you know, figure out committee assignments uh, over the coming months. Uh, next slide. Um, and as I'm going through these slides, if anybody has any questions, any of the stakeholders, um, since, since we've got the volume up, so I should be able to hear those now, feel free to send those in to, to Christian or whomever's taken those and glad to pause and answer any questions while I'm walking you guys through this, but also at the end as well. Um, what do we do? Uh, we oversee financial reporting processes, uh, internal financial controls, um, the external internal audit process, uh, which historically I will tell you at PSPRS was lousy. It wasn't well done. Um, it, there was problems all over it, which is why I think that um, the system was not held in high regard. I think it was, um, it was just a poorly run organization, both at the C-suite level and at the board level in terms of how these pieces all mesh together. The organization that you have today um, is uh, compared to when I joined you know, 18 or 20 months ago, is an entirely different board, an entirely different organization, and an entirely different committee structure that I will tell you are working 
uh, not perfectly, but are working very, very well. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, as, as Mike Townsend will tell you, we're you know, partway across the river, but we're going in the right direction. And over the coming months and years, as we finish to tighten up the processes and put things in place, uh, I think all the stakeholders will, uh, that trust and confidence will build back that what we tell you is accurate. Um, and when we come to you with questions, we want your input and insight uh, so we get a better process and a better output that all stakeholders are comfortable with. Um, the uh, one, one of the roles of the committee obviously is to, to um, you know, it, keep the, the full board up to speed in terms of where are we at on things. Um, so some of the areas we're focused and again, there's crossover between ops and governance and obviously the, the um, audit committee, but things like ethics policies, code of conduct, you know, some of the things you guys have all read about in the newspapers of where um, things have not always gone well over the last decade for PSPRS. A lot of those issues have been addressed through the policies and through those internal and external feedback loops. But again, policies, code of conduct, fraud policies, uh, internal controls, financial reporting. How do you know that the money's where it's at, where it's supposed to be, the checks are going out, they're correct. Uh, and then how do you make sure that your, your management team, um, you have a dashboard of success and um, make sure that they're um, uh, following those rules and those governance that's been set down. That's all part of the duty of, of an audit committee that's active and hands-on and knowledgeable. And I would say, that, again, this is a good committee um, that, that is uh, getting better by the day. Uh, next slide. Um, what's the audit committee actually have authority to do? So it's all well and good to talk about these things, but does, what, what can the audit committee actually do? How does it report up to the board? How does it interface with management and all of the stakeholders? Um, we've got, as a committee, we've got the ability to, to um, look into things. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did was we, for 10 years, there had not been an RFP um, for external auditors, um, that's ridiculous, right? There's no organization that should run that way. Despite what a governance manual says, you always do that because if you get too comfortable with your external auditors, you doesn't mean they're bad, just you run the risk. There's the problem or potential for, for um, that relationship to be too close. And um, you want it to be a, a respectful working relationship, but those, those two functions have to work independently. So we went out obviously on a new F RFP, we hired Clifton Larson, who came in and did a lot of forensic accounting for us and really got under a lot of the reasons why there were failures on the general ledger, on the feedback loops, um, and a lot of the systems that, quite frankly, when Epic 1 and Epic 2 transitioned, just weren't there. And so we literally dropped GL support. And so the feedback loop to the board um, and the feedback loop that was going to the management committee just didn't exist. It wasn't there. And so a lot of the rebuild that that Mike's and, and John have done over this last year is really getting all of that put back together. We introduced a new GL module um, and uh, new software uh, in July and um, it's it's uh, there's still work to be done but um, we, we've got a lot better feedback. Um, if you looked if anybody's read through the audit um, that Clifton Larson did, same thing, a lot of areas where we need to improve, a uh, tremendous number of areas we need to improve, but those are being systematically um, uh, attacked one by one and brought up to the standard that they should have been at a long time ago. Um, uh, feedback, I mean, I, I talk on a monthly basis, uh, I'll, I would talk with uh, the prior internal auditor one-on-one, -on -one, right? She would talk to the committee, I would talk to her one-on-one, -on -one. I would give John a call, I would give Mike a call, and you know, trying to make sure that that feedback loop was working. It's working much, much better than it was a year ago. And again, we've still got some room to go, but, but, but the committee and the board are, are satisfied that, the, um, that that feedback loop, loop is now working well. Um, outside general counsel, uh, we hired um, uh, uh, to come in, uh, Kevin O'Malley and his team, also a very critical part of the audit committee is uh, making sure you've got outside independent legal counsel so when specific questions come up uh, they're answered by that fiduciary counsel and uh, Kevin and Terry um, have just done a tremendous job for us over this past year um, in, uh, in guiding us and helping us as we work through some of the legal ramifications as we um, build a better mousetrap. Uh, next slide. Um, 
recommended full audit of PSPRS financial reports following the CAFR. Um, we're looking through uh, the bullet point issues that you see here. Again, most of the stakeholders, I think, are well aware of what these issues are. And um, uh, Clifton Larson uh, was critical uh, in that process with us, uh, bringing their skill set in, their pension group that specializes in pension, uh, which is what you want, obviously, when you're a pension fund. But very, very helpful, the team that's worked with the internal um, uh, management team, and then obviously us as, a, as the audit committee. Um, they're looking at additional hiring and staffing in, in the accounting function to continue to build that team out. But I will tell you, again, I'd put that team up against any team in the United States today. That's how deep that bench has become under uh, Mike's leadership over this last year. Um, we recommended to the board a new general ledger. Obviously, that was put in place because the old general ledger uh, didn't work. Uh, it just, it uh, when Epic 1 and Epic 2 unplugged, uh, there was a gap and that gap was not filled and that gap is now filled. Um, next slide. Um, uh, Clifton Larson, uh, some of these things we've already touched on. The um, uh, John Mormon's phenomenal, our CFO. Um, if you haven't met him, make sure you, next time we're all distanced, but um, stop in and say hi to him. That sharp guy knows his stuff. Um, he's done a great job, again, building that bench out below him of quality people. Clark's joined our team. Um, again, just top, top flight people that are now running uh, the financial side of this organization, which was something that was missing when I joined this board two years ago. It just was not there. Um, uh, the completion of the CAFR, um, we got it done by mid-December. We're supposed to have it done by December 1st. Um, we're working hard on that. Uh, uh, there was a lot of work to be done, um, but we'll we'll get it done. Um, it's We'll get it done by December 1st, hopefully this year, uh, to meet that target date. Um, internal controls, a lot of this is all about segregation of duties. You have to make sure um, that uh, you not only look at what the audit findings are, but you actually come up with a plan. Uh, I was, I in the, the the audit committee were working closely with the prior internal auditor um, and we rank ordered about 50 items, right? And pick the first 10 to work down the list, but you, you've got to make them a priority. You've got to follow through and make sure that loop is in place, which it is. Uh, next slide, please. Um, audit plan was approved in uh, September, 2020 for you know, fiscal 2021. Um, the uh, bullet point two is um, that was what we were doing with the internal auditor is really looking at what are the targeted areas, right? Where where do we have weakness? Um, we're on a one to 10 or a three or a four, and we want everything to be eights or nines or tens. And so we've got the targeted areas um, laid out um, and uh, we're, we're systematically working through those. Um, the management team is working through those and obviously the audit committee is, is following that list to make sure that it's occurring. Um, additional policies. Uh, Tim's working through those right now. Uh, we'll elevate some of that to the board level as we get that buttoned up here over the next uh, month or two. Um, the uh, internal auditor looking really at the different functionality, everything from Mark Steed's department to uh, the, the, the accounting functions. Oh, where's the risk in the organization, right? If there was going to be a problem how do I spot that risk before it shows up? And then how do I put process in place or redundancy in place not to slow the organization down or create needless bureaucracy, but how do I make sure that that's really working how it's supposed to be working so you don't have a fail and everybody looks at each other and says, I didn't think of that. So we've spent as a committee quite a bit of time uh, with the management team looking at that. Um, the, uh, we're working with the investment committee um, of which I sit on as well, uh, really looking at the disclosure policies to make sure for not only internal staff, but also all of the trustees um, are don't have conflicts of interest. You don't want anything that um, looks bad. Um, and um, you know the key to that is having a policy in place and then making sure that policy is followed uh, because um, that's, that's how we'll build trust and credibility back with all stakeholders. Uh, next slide. Um, working on the CAFR process to make it more streamlined. That's an ongoing process. Um, GASB, um, uh, in, internal controls and documentation, some of the things that we've already touched on, um, those are all the goals, right? The goal is to make it transparent in a well-run organization um, that has checks and balances in places. So if any of our stakeholders 
um, have questions on those function areas, we can point specifically to what it is, what the dashboard is, and how we know that it's working and it's working well. Uh, next slide. Um, same thing, just to, to recap, the, the, um, any of the audit committee members are always available uh, for anybody on this call. If you have a question, pick up the phone. Uh, we are, uh, we're paying attention. We want input from you, um, whether it's a, a, a compliment, hopefully we'll get a few compliments uh, and for the team that's done such a great job, uh, Mike and John and everyone, but also um, if you have concerns, right? If there's areas of concern, um, whether it's around you know, the financial statements, whether it's around actual assumptions, how we're running the math, right? How do we know what the next collective five, 10 and 20 year periods looks like so we can get this system um, fully solvent and um, be in good shape financially um, for again, all of the stakeholders, everybody from taxpayers to the towns and cities to the members that are gonna count on this when they work hard for 20 or 25 years and retire. All of those pieces have to work well together. And this committee uh, is an integral part of making sure that the math, the math works, right? That the, the, the assumptions that are put into the modeling are indeed correct. Um, so everybody can budget and plan around those and have comfort that um, what they've been told is gonna to occur actually occurs. Um, most importantly, um, that, that, that feedback loop again, so we can, we can measure everything. If you can't measure it um, uh, as a business guy, you know, if, you, if you can't put a metric in and a dashboard to measure it, you're doing something wrong. And that's part of what we're doing is we're building those dashboards out that we can watch for red, green, and yellow. Um, glad to answer any questions you guys have. Uh, Christian, do we have any questions? Trustee Amaduri, we do not have any questions on the line, but we'll give it, let's say, 20 to 30 seconds here to see if any questions come in. And if they don't, we're going to break for our 20-minute uh, break and return at noon uh, for actuarial Brad Heinrich's discussion. Great. Uh, again, thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and, you know, let us as trustees, we're... we're, we're proud and honored to be able to serve this board. Arizona has been my home for 30 years. My, my wife's fourth generation. I moved out here from Ohio in 1988, which is hard to believe. And we've raised our three children here. This is, I love this state and, and our, our first responders and everybody that's part of the system. Um, I am thankful for every day. And so um, again, reach out to any of us, get to know us as people. Um, we would be more than glad to, to, to chat with you and spend time with you. Um, hopefully this is uh, all good to go, Christian. Please chime in if I'm if the, you're not seeing my screen or seeing me. Um, I am Brad Heinrichs. I'm the the president of Foster and Foster. We're the PRS PSPRS's actuary, and for the next forty minutes, you're going to uh, get into some actuarial uh, fun, um, is what I'm calling it. It's sort of an oxymoron type phrase. Uh, but I will, uh, my, my, my goal here today is really to just kind of update you on what's been going on in the last 12 months within PSPRS and, um, and, and talk a little bit about some of the improvements that we think that we've made along the way and then open it up to questions because I'm sure you have burning questions for the actuary. So let me, let me just uh, get started here. Um, I can figure out how to turn the page. All right, um, so in the last 12 months or so, I've, I've listed some of PSPRS board's uh, strategic initiatives. First, uh, I'll say that while this, uh, th this certainly doesn't uh, include all of them, these are just ones that um, I felt like had at least to some level a, an actuarial uh, input or involvement. Um, one thing I think that, that any board member would tell you is that they have really gone to great lengths over the last 12 months to really encourage involvement from all stakeholders, whether that be from an advisory board standpoint or, or uh, in some of the tools that we've put together, uh, really been trying to involve each of you in what they are doing, what they're thinking and getting feedback. At least that's been their effort, I believe. Um, secondly, and we're going to talk a little bit more about each one of these, um, improving intergenerational equities within the plan and how it's funded, how the plan is funded. And the concept of intergenerational equity 
is one that I think all public pension plans really have to tackle. And it has to do with charging the same generation of taxpayers um, a fee for the pensions that are being accrued and earned during that, their generation and not kicking the can to future generations of taxpayers to cover the bill. And, and so the, the, the board has spent quite a bit of time with me and talking amongst themselves and, and others um, about how to, how to do this better. And so I'll, I'll touch on that. The next one, and this is something that I think maybe Harry might be getting into a little bit more even after uh, my talk, and that is looking at relooking at the asset allocation to take some advantages of our current cash flow environment. Uh, that was really a fun project for me, and um, it's one that I think Harry will be able to expand upon. And then last, something that we're doing right now is to change our funding policy to make sure and, uh, and update it to make sure that all of the objectives are clear and they're prioritized and that so when, when future boards take over, uh, future board members will have a blueprint for the future for which to, to abide by and, and keep this train running down the right track. And so we're gonna to touch on at least a few of these topics uh, this afternoon. Um, so I mentioned encouraging involvement from stakeholders. What do I mean? Uh, really conferences, these town hall meetings. I know that Mike and, and, and some of the board members, Scott and, and maybe Harry um, as well, have gone out and, and, and talked with you either individually or in, in sort of what I call town hall style meetings. I've participated in some of those. And the idea, of course, is to educate, to get feedback, to hear what's going on within your, your communities and, and to really help us or help the board make really good financial decisions that, that don't hamstring anybody, but at the same time, um, acting as a fiduciary to the plan and its members to make sure that the, that the assets are there to pay for all these pensions. Um, modeling tools, this is probably one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I spent, me and my staff have spent quite a bit of time putting together modeling tools that hopefully you have uh, taken a look at. And if not, I'm going to show you today. And the idea is to try to um, install some more transparency so that you guys can, can look and see what the impact is of, of a whole bunch of what ifs on your individual plan um, within PSPRS. And then, and then last, um, the board this year resurrected the, resurrected the advisory committee, which I think can, consists of, of, of labor groups, um, uh, you know, League of Cities and towns and, and, and special districts. And really it's a, it's a committee that, that has stakeholders from all different areas. And, and the idea is to have a smaller group of folks to provide impact or uh, to provide input to the board and feedback to the board on certain topics that the board um, are interested in. And in this last year, the board has made some sweeping changes on the actuarial front. And I would argue that if it wasn't for the advisory committee, those, those changes might have been, might, may have been delayed. They may not have uh, gone through. I don't know, it's speculative, but I do know that in talking with the board members, they really appreciated the advisory board's diligence and their, um, you know, and, and their direction in this process. Um, so I've talked a little bit about intergenerational equities and the concept of trying to make sure that we're not putting off to future taxpayers what today's taxpayers should be bearing the burden for. And, and there's this concept in, in, in pension funding called the unfunded liability. It really amounts to debt on the books. And for PSPRS, that debt is about $9.6 billion um, as of uh, June 30th, 2020. Um, previously, um, the approach to which the debt was being paid down was one that as an actuary, I didn't love. Um, just being straight up and honest with you, uh, the, you know, we've all heard of interest only mortgages on homes. Um, for many, many of the entities within PSPRS, because of the length of the mortgage and the way that it was set up, um, many of the entities were not paying um, even the interest on the debt that, that, that was attached to them. And, and from my perspective, that is not 
um, achieving intergenerational equity. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite. It is kicking the can down the road. Um, and, and frankly, I think in, in talking with the board, a lot of the board members um, you know, didn't really understand a lot of the mechanics of, of the pension funding. And so we spent quite a bit of time uh, really going over that. And once, they, once the board understood, the advisory board understood, um, they felt that it was necessary to, to, to make some changes to the manner in which we pay off our debt. Um, essentially, the, the way that the debt was being paid off was a, in, a, in an approach that um, the first payment starts extremely low, way less than the interest incurred on the debt, but the payment itself grows at 3.5% a year. And as it grows at 3.5% a year, the idea is that payroll will grow at 3.5% a year. And if it does, then the payment when expressed as a percentage of payroll will be the same. And so the concept was, oh, hey, if payroll grows at 3.5% a year, we can just have a level payment as a percentage of payroll to, to pay off the debt. Well, that works just fine as long as payroll is growing at 3.5% a year. And by the way, when I say payroll, I don't mean just regular salary increases. I mean the payroll of the entire department. So when you have someone retire making $100,000 and then they're replaced by someone making $40,000, your payroll just went down $60,000. Um, and, and so uh, the so understanding that 3.5% payroll growth on a year-to-year -year basis, that's pretty substantial. And it requires a lot of new people every year and a growing population. What we found was that in looking historically, the payroll growth within PSPRS all in for the, for the entire group was around 1% per year on average. So when payroll is not growing at one, but the payments are growing at three and a half, what happens to the cost to the, to the entities? Well, it's growing every single year as a percentage of payroll. And I think a lot of the entities either weren't aware or, or maybe not fully a, a aware of the, of the approach. And so the board really wanted to make some unilateral changes and they did. They didn't wanna push off any debts to future generations of taxpayers. With the blessing and the direction of the advisory committee, the board voted to gradually decrease this payroll growth rate in each plan, pay more of the, of the debt off um, on an annual basis, paying principal on the debt, um, <laughs> And, and eliminate this thing I call negative amortization, which really means that if we're not paying the interest off, then the debt's growing. Um, if I've got a house and the, the, it's a $100,000 house and my interest rate is 7.3%, um, that means that I'm encourage, incurring about $7,300 worth of interest each month or each year. If I'm only making a three or $4,000 payment, you and I both know that now the next year I owe more on the house than I did before because the, the, the interest is growing on the debt faster than I'm paying it off. And so the, the board has made changes to, to, to eliminate this um, gradually um, and accelerate our payments on the debt. All in, how big of a deal is this? Over time for all three plans, PSPRS, Corp and EORP, these changes that the board made are gonna save between 1.1 and 1.4 billion dollars. Um, it's not very often that you get to save a billion dollars. Um, I tried to renegotiate my contract to get a piece of this. They said, no, I understand it, I guess. Um, I'm teasing. Uh, but in any event, saving over a billion dollars was really, really cool. And I was, it was exciting and, and, and neat for me uh, to be a part of that uh, process. And so that was a, a really big deal and, and a landmark um, decision that the board made. Um, the next thing that the board looked at, and this is something that if you read about pensions, the first thing you'll read about is probably the unfunded liability. Um, the second thing will be, or, and what it is, the next thing will be this concept of an assumed rate of return. When we have pensions, um, the, you know, we've got these pension promises that were, that as the actuary, we try to figure out what those are going to be in the future. Well, in order to determine what the contribution requirements need to be, we need to figure out based upon our, our current um, asset pool, how much money we need to contribute to that asset pool over time to be able to pay for all these, these benefits. Well, in order to do that, we need to figure out what sort of return we anticipate to earn on that asset pool? Well, currently, um, the, the assumption has been, is and has been for a little bit anyway, 
7.3%. And, and if you were to ask most people out there without any sort of pension background, and maybe even some that do have a pension background, they'll tell you 7.3% is just hogwash. What are these people thinking? That is unattainable, ridiculous. Um, and so what the board said was, you know, because we, we, we read about this assumption, um, and, and it's certainly a, a hot button in the world of, of pension funding, um, they said, Brad, what do you think about this 7.3? I said, well, let's, let's, let's analyze it. Um, and, and what I would first suggest, and this is where they, we get into the intergenerational equity, um, the first thing I suggested was 7.3, it's either, it's, it, it, chances are we're not going to be right. It's not, we're not going to earn 7.3% every single year. We're just not. The markets are volatile. There'll be good years. There'll be bad years. Over time, 7.3% seems reasonable. It may be high, may be low. But what the board did, and, and I suggested that they highly recommended that they do so, they've made it so that whether we're right or wrong or way right or way wrong, what they've done is that they've installed the, what I would call safeguards such that when we don't meet the 7.3%, we're going to be making up that difference over a reasonable period of time. We're not gonna kick it 25 or 30 years down the road and ask a future generation of taxpayers to cover it, to, any, to cover any shortfalls. And so the idea is that any future um, surpluses or shortfalls will ultimately be amortized over a 15 year period. So over 15 years, we're gonna, we're gonna make up that difference. And that's, that's the ultimate objective here. Um, so whether we're right or wrong, you know, we're gonna make sure that we at least uh, cover our bases either in terms of a credit or a shortfall over a, over a reasonable period of time. But instead, but just that, that aside, we still need to feel really good about our 7.3% because we, we wanna assume what we expect is our best estimate of future experience. So how do we do that? What I suggested was that in order to really get to an appropriate assumed rate of return, the first thing you have to understand are your cash flows. Okay. Once you understand your cash flows, then you can determine how you would want to invest your money. Once you figured out how you want to invest your money and you know what your asset allocation is going to be, only then can you determine whether your 7.3% is the right number. Um, and so that's really the, the, the process that we went through. And, and so what we did was we said, okay, let's look at cash flow projections for the next 25 years. Okay. When I say cash flow projections, we project out the contributions, we project out the benefits, and we project out all the expenses that we expect to pay. And the difference between our contributions, our benefits, and our expenses will, will tell us kind of what our cash flow needs are. Okay. What we found is that at least for the next 10 plus years, could be as many as 15 years uh, or so, that our contributions are going to be bigger than our benefits and expenses. So we're gonna be cash flow positive. What does that really mean? What that means is our current assets that we have in the, in the account right now aren't gonna be needed for quite a long time, all right? And so you say, well, what difference does that make, Brad? And I said, well, what I would argue that what difference that makes is that tells you that you can invest differently than if our cash flows are, are highly negative over the short, medium, and long term. If I'm Pay, if, I'm, if I've got to make a whole bunch of, of, of payments from our asset pool on a monthly basis, then I'm not able to invest in long-term performing assets. One of the things, uh, the chart I have on this slide number six was, was one that I, I find interesting because it's basically answering the question, well, should you invest in stocks or bonds? Okay, and it's a generic question, um, but it's really answering the question how long or how often do long-term bonds beat stocks? So, um, you know, what this really says is that if I was to find any 40-year period, okay, looking at the bottom, there's really only a 0.3% chance, looking historically, going back to 1926, that over a 40-year period, bonds outperform the equity markets. Um, obviously, in the real short-term, bonds can certainly outperform equities, but the longer time period you go, you see that the chances are slimmer and slimmer that bonds are going to outperform stocks. 
So what does that really mean? If I'm not gonna, if I'm not gonna need money for 10 plus years, that's kind of like saying, hey, Brad, I've got some money I want you to invest for me. And uh, which would be a bad idea because I'm not a I'm not a professional investor. I'm just an actuary. Uh, talk to Harry in the next in the next session. He's much better at that than me. Um, but in any event, what I would tell you though is, and I think I would be right, is that if you're not going to need your money for a, a, a good period of time, then you can take on a little bit more risk. And what I mean by a little bit more risk is that you can invest in some performing assets that we anticipate are going to generate a long, a, a better return over the long term. Okay, because that's what we have. We have long term um, versus something that might be more short term and and conservative. Okay, so this was sort of an epiphany that we had as a board um, to say, wow, we're kind of in a, in a unique situation here that our cash flows are are very positive. So um, the board uh, enlisted the investment committee to take a look at, at, at different, um, uh, portfolios to say, okay, you know, if we were to, we've got our current, current portfolio here, where we're expecting to earn, um, around 7.3, a little bit more of that than that. And it has a standard deviation of 12.9%. Standard deviation is just really a, a fancy term for how much, how volatile, the, the returns are relative to our expectation. And they said, well, Brad, if we had, um, if we were to, to invest in assets that we think are gonna perform a little bit better over the long term, but along with that comes a higher standard deviation, more volatility, the question is, is that better for us or not? And, and that's really what we tried to, to analyze here. So option one is a little, taking on what I would consider to be a little bit more risk, but with a little bit more expected return. Option two, again, more, more return expectation, a little bit more risk. Option three, same thing. So option three is the, the riskiest portfolio with a highest standard deviation. And let me just tell you again, these are diversified equity portfolios. This is not the give Brad Heinrichs a bunch of money to go to Vegas portfolio um, and, and see how well he can count cards. This is more... Um, about uh, you know investing in a in a in a diversified portfolio that has a strong expectation of return but has a little bit more volatility as you move through option one to option three. So what do we find out here? Um, and, and again, this is this is the the, the cool part of this. Um, and I don't know if I can if you can use, see my see my cursor. So we split this up into really looking at this in terms of what are the impacts of each of these portfolios on contribution results over a one-year period, a 10-year period, or a 20-year period? Okay. So, what do we, so we did a thousand different scenarios. Um, you know, it's like actuaries love to, 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 to do things lots and lots of times to, to try to come up with an answer. And so we, we ran what we call Monte Carlo simulations. Almost sounds like Vegas, um, uh, but it's not. Um, we did a thousand different Monte Carlo simulations and we said, okay, under our current approach, option one, two, and three, what are the likely contribution requirements for 2023 in terms of millions of dollars? And what you see here, obviously, as, as we go across the spectrum of risk, um, the results become more widely spread, as you might expect, right? That when in a more conservative portfolio, which we currently have, the current in the current approach, you see that the results from uh, go from 785 up to about 820, and that's represent. And, the, and by the way, the middle the, the middle part here represents about the 50th percentile. So the red is the five to the 25th percentile, and 25th to 100, or 25th to 75, or 25th to 50, and then it goes from 50 to 75, and 75 to 100 um, percent, and so. What you find is that the dispersion in contribution requirements uh, clearly becomes greater the more risk we take on. But here's where it gets interesting to me is when you move over, say, 10 years, okay, and you start looking at the risk that we're taking, looking at the top of the blue, saying, okay, well, you know, worst case scenario over the 10 year period, what are we kind of looking at in terms of contributions? Notice how. The, the numbers, the worst case scenario kind of stays pretty level. But look what on the better case scenario, 
notice how the contribution requirements as we move along really have a, the opportunity to, to, to be smaller. And you see just in looking at sort of the average that the average is going down as you might expect, but what this is really showing you is that the volatility, did I lose my screen here? Something happened. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Um, the volatility is dampened by the way that we amortize and smooth our investment returns. So, and when you look over a 20 year period, you see that the, the worst case scenarios are really not much different, but look how much better off we can be by taking on um, a little bit more what I call risk, more standard deviation in order to get more returns. You're looking at the unfunded liability, the same thing, the same uh, result occurs. Over the one year period, ah, doesn't, doesn't look any, that appetizing. But when you look over a 10 year period or, or a 20 year period, you can see that there's a decent chance that by 2032, we don't have an unfunded liability anymore by taking on um, a little bit more standard deviation um, and, and getting on some more return. Um, and, and then when we get farther out, it's almost a 50-50 proposition, better than a 50-50 proposition that we will have paid down an off, paid off our unfunded liability by that time by taking on a little bit more risk and um, giving up some more standard deviation or, or um, taking on more risk to get a bigger return, okay? So what are the conclusions that we drew from this process? Um, the alternative scenarios provide some pretty positive results for the system. And I think the investment committee noticed this and it's a result of, of the actuarial smoothing and the way that we're amortizing the unfunded liability it's allowing them to take a bit more aggressive approach. When I say aggressive, I don't, again, I don't mean silly and careless. I just mean going for um, uh, res assets that have a higher expected return um, with a little bit more uh, standard deviation. And, and you know, kind of cutting to the chase, and I don't want to um, you know, uh, steal Harry's thunder, but the last I think I heard um, in the investment committee, I think Harry might have mentioned that the fund was up over 12% as the last update that I heard for 2021. So they've, they've made some changes to their asset allocation and to their portfolio. And they are, and, and you are paying, uh, are, are receiving the benefits from those changes. And again, I think Harry will, will probably get into to more of that in his session, which follows mine. But from an actuarial perspective, my point was to let you know that that their their decisions made sense and they were they were grounded in in mathematics and not just a hey let's just take on more risk and hmm, sounds like a good idea. Um, it also shows that 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 our seven point three um, based upon the the allocation that they've settled on is 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 over the long term we believe to be very conservative and not overly aggressive. And again, one thing that you should, you should keep in mind is that 7.3% assumed rate of return is not necessarily the return that we expect to earn this year or even next year. That assumption represents the return we expect to earn until the last member of this plan dies. So this is a probably 75, 80 year number. This is because there's probably 20 year, 20 old, 20 year olds in this plan. So this is not a five year number or even a 10 year number. This is a much, uh, this is a, we're looking way out into the horizon. Okay. Um, so you might say to yourself, all right, Brad. Brad, this uh, is Christian. If I could, uh, if I could uh, interject with a quick question. Uh, from what I can tell, this question has to do with the actuarial components that we find in the employer valuations. And the question reads, uh, this year, the other category seems to be a significant contributing factor to a lot of employer contribution rate movements. Can we explain real quick what, um, or could you explain uh, what sort of components fall in the other category? Yeah, so, so a lot of times the other category has to do with things like, well, so we had um, 
Christian Palmer in our data last year, and it said that he was born in 1969. And this year, um, the data came in and it shows that he was born in 1959. And, and so, oh, Christian's a little bit older than we thought. And, oh, gosh, he's almost he's able, he's able to retire now, so the liability is greater. Um, it could be it, – it's usually data-related. Um, and and I, let me kind of take a step back. Um, the, the PSPRS staff really underwent a, a huge um, overhaul this year. Um, when it comes to the approach and process for which they're giving us data. Um, I think in the past, there were a lot of manual entries. There was a, a lot of the data that was provided to us was in a manual format. And, and I think that the PSPRS staff um, did, a, did a really good job this year of cleaning up some data issues and automating things. So hopefully in the future, you're not going to see a lot of other category kind, types of, of um, numbers. Uh, the other idea or the other concept that I think uh, had an impact was, it might say that Christian Palmer made $35,000 in terms of the pay, but that you know, the, the question was, and it wasn't always necessarily consistent, was the $35,000 the pay that he made for the time period up to uh, 630 2020 or is that his pay rate going forward um, you know which is it and, and I think there were some inconsistencies there um, that, that needed to be ironed out and so I think a lot of the other category items were really cleaning up data issues in general um, and I'd be happy to whoever asked the question I'm, I'm happy to to give more specific um, answers to the that question if I'm given um, the 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 plan and you know which whichever plan it is, okay. Thank you, Brad. We have about ten minutes left for the actuarial Perfect. modeler. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to reshare again if I if, see if I can do this right. And so the idea here is to go over. Let's see here. Um, all right. Okay. Is everybody, are you seeing that, Christian? Hopefully. Yes, we see that. You're, you're okay. Doing... So, so, so you might say to me, all right, Brad, sounds good. You think you're smart. 7.3 is, is, it's the right number. Um, and, and, you know, but I don't necessarily believe you. Okay. And I'll say, fine, that's fine. You don't have to believe me. In fact, you don't even have to contribute based upon that 7.3 if you don't want to. If you think that the number is, is not 7.3, but rather it's more like 6%, then this modeler is perfect for you. What this modeler can do is you can go in here and say, okay, if we changed our assumed rate of return to 6%, Now let's try it again. Oh, that said 600. Ah, 6 percent. Oops. All right. If we change it to 6%, then what this will show you is what the contributions will look like if, and again, we assume 6% and we earn 6%. All right. And so if you look down here, you'll see, oh, we change if we if we contribute based on six percent. Look, the costs are, are much higher than what we were originally projecting. Why is that? Because we're assuming six percent, and then we can also pick what was actually earned. So let's say that we assume six percent, but we're going to earn. Oh, let's put an input schedule. Let's earn seven point three. All right. We assume six, but earn. 7.3, and what you see here when I'm looking at the contribution requirements, that the costs go up. The red is the red is is what we. Uh, by the way, the red is it represents the change, like what we're changing, and the blue represents well, if everything happens the way the board expected, 
which is 7.3 and 7.3, okay? If we earn six, or we, we assume six, but earn seven and a half, see how the costs go up, but they level off and eventually go down as opposed to continuously uh, barely increasing if we are um, assuming 7.3 and earning 7.3. So what this allows you to do is to contribute based upon either a different assumption rate or a different um, actual expectation. Again, when you get your valuation, that tells you what your minimum requirements are. You always have to contribute at least the minimum. But if you want to be more conservative and contribute based upon a more conservative set of assumptions, that's perfectly fine. Making, making contributions in excess of the minimum payment, just like American Express is happy with it, so is the PSPRS pension board. More than happy to have you contribute more than, than, than expected. Now, here's an interesting thing. If we contribute, if we assume six, but earn 7.3, look what happens here. You look over here, what you'll see is that over since through 2000, 2053, so year 2053, by assuming less, you're contributing more early, okay? You'll end up, this is just Phoenix Police, for example, you will end up contributing $445 million less over the next 30 years or so than you would have if you were just contributing the minimum based upon 7.3. And that just has to do with contributing more now and less later because the more money you put in, the more money's there to earn, uh, earn investment return on. And we're going to be earning 7.3 in this example. And so you'll see that you will, that, that Phoenix would be saving money. Again, I'm coming over here. Phoenix will be saving money to the tune of almost um, a half a billion dollars um, over the next 30 years by doing something like that. All right, and this is just for Phoenix Police. And by the way, you can change in the modeler, you can pick any, any, any individual uh, entity within PSPRS. There's also a court modeler, EORP modeler, um, that, you can, that, you, that you can utilize as well. All right, so I'm going to move this back just to give you, um, so I'm going to assume that we earn the 7.3. And now you say, okay, um, I know that the board is phasing in this concept of payroll growth. Let's say that we really want to, we don't want to have the concept. Again, let's look at it here. And these are a lot of small numbers, so I apologize. But what you see here, and I'll just look at the current. If you look at the unfunded liability, what you see is that it's growing, okay, substantially until it starts to finally fall. And, and notice, too, that it takes until 2032 to have an unfunded liability that is less than what it is in 2020, okay? And if I was to look and I added up the contributions that are being made, okay, even with the board's changes, and by the way, this was way worse before than what we're showing here, but this is about $2.6 billion in payments that, will, that are being made during this time period. So they're going to be making $2.6 billion in payments, and the unfunded liability just now became less than what it was, when I say just now, in 2032 is the first time that the unfunded liability is less than it was July 1, 2020, okay? So let's say that you said, you know what, I don't like that idea. I want to be able to start paying off principal on my unfunded from day one. Okay, well, then we're not going to have any payroll growth assumption. We're not going to have any negative amortization. We're going to make this 0%, and we're going to make it immediate. Okay, so what happens then? Um, well, you see the contributions go way up, but ultimately they're a lot less than they would have been otherwise. And then also when you go to table two, what you see on the alternative is look at the unfunded liability starting in 2022 because that represents the, the, the first year that the 2020 um, valuation, uh, it, it sets that um, the, the payments for 2022, you see that starting here, that unfunded liability is dropping every single year. And so in 2032, where it would have otherwise been 2.1 billion, 
it's now 1.85 billion. And you see how it just goes, it, it, it really uh, tails off and ultimately, again, going up to here, you can see the, the ultimate results. By doing such a thing, uh, Phoenix for police would save $608 million over that time period by getting rid of the negative amortization, immediately paying principal from, from day one. Okay, now let's do one more thing and then I'll open it up to more questions. I think I'm about to the end. Let's say Phoenix decides, you know what? I'm starting to think, I'm starting to understand this, this uh, that by putting more money in now, it's really gonna help us. You say, well, what if I put in a bill? What if I floated a pension obligation bond and put in a billion dollars? Let's say I put in a billion dollars Okay, what does that do to the funding requirements? Oh, well, here we go. If I put in a billion dollars into the Phoenix Police Program, you'll see, okay, their funding requirements way higher or the funding amount was way up, way high, and then it's lower from that point forward. You say, well, what does that really do for us? When you come on over here, you can see that the $1 billion of extra contribution means that you're going to be contributing one point, almost one point four billion dollars less over time. So by making that, pen, doing that pension obligation bond, from the pension plan standpoint, you're going to save about three hundred eighty million dollars. Um, now the question is, how much are you going to be paying on the other end? The 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 likelihood is that you're not going to come close to that. Um, and and so the you know because the the debts here are growing at 7.3 you're borrowing typically at a rate of two or three percent um the the city ends up um realizing an arbitrage they'll they'll be paying at two or three and they're earning seven seven point three um it really becomes a financially viable approach to paying down debt um that i think a lot of entities are taking a look at now so I, I know that I've gone to the end of my rope. I don't know if there's time for a question or two, but I will leave that up to Christian. Brad, we're going to have to move along to our next presentation in five minutes here. Um, I do want to pass along a special message from Chairman Scott McCarty, who expresses his sincere gratitude that you found time to get off the Florida golf courses. Uh, and <laughs> Mr. McCarty would like to uh, add that he feels that you and your firm have a have been a tremendous contributing factor to the uh, uh, the board's success and the future success of the system. Uh, well, with that, you. we thank will you. be introducing uh, Mr. Harry Papp, the and, chairman. And what I may try to do is treatment. answer some of these other questions, Christian, that were that were posed um, in by typing. That sounds great. Thank you, Brad. Go ahead, Harry. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Harry Papp. I'm a trustee. Uh, I've been on the board for a little more than three years, and uh, I am vice chair of the board, and I also chair the investment committee. And um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about uh, my background and, um, and in, um, you know, what I'm doing here. And, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how, um, uh, how the investment committee and the board works in conjunction with our staff, our investment staff, and our outside consultants, and ultimately the various managers that invest these funds for us. And um, uh, I'll just start off, um, uh, when I'm not doing PSPRS uh, uh, things, I'm a managing partner of a local investment advisory firm. Uh, my dad started it 43 years ago. He passed away 40 years ago. Uh, my wife and I came out to join him 39 and a half years ago. So um, it started off as a small firm. Uh, we have 11 partners, uh, 10 support staff. We have a little over a billion dollars of, uh, uh, of money that we're managing primarily for wealthy individuals. And um, although we do have some <clears throat> number of retirement plans, um, endowments, and uh, other types of uh, investment uh, assets. But um, uh, it's a, a small private firm. Uh, it, we are very high touch. We're very uh, uh, 
uh, uh, we pay a lot of attention to the individual clients. Um, so my background, um, uh, I have a, a master's in business administration uh, with a concentration in finance and accounting from the University of Chicago. I have an undergraduate uh, degree in economics and chemistry at uh, Brown. And uh, um, in addition to um, PSPRS, I serve on the board. Of, I've been on the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Arizona board for a little more than 20 years. Um, I chair the finance committee there. I'm a former board chair of Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, that's a wonderful company. Uh, we take care of uh, almost one and a half million Arizonans healthcare. And it's a, we're technically a not-for-profit. We're not owned by shareholders, but uh, um, it's a, a wonderful organization and we do a terrific job for our, our customers. Um, the, uh, there, um, I help our chief investment officer and our chief financial officer look after a billion dollar portfolio of reserves and investments. I'm also on the board of the Phoenix Zoo. Uh, that's really fun. Um, the, uh, you can hear about how to take care of an elephant or a quarry bustard. Um, and not surprisingly, I serve on the finance committee there and I'm a, a past, I've, I've been board chair uh, twice over the last 36 years that I've been out there. Uh, I'm on the Arizona State University Foundation Board. Um, I chair the audit committee currently. Um, and previously, uh, I've been on the investment committee probably 22 years now. Um, and uh, we have a little over a billion dollars in endowment out there. And I chaired that committee for nine years and I still serve on it. Um, Arizona uh, State Board of Investment. Uh, this looks after the state permanent fund. Uh, I think uh, most of you know that when Arizona became a state, the federal government gave the state uh, almost 10 million acres of land. And over the years, some of that's been sold off and it's been uh, put into an investment uh, portfolio. And um, five of us on the Arizona State Board of Investment uh, look after those funds and the investments with the staff. Uh, that fund has just gone over $7 billion. Uh, something like 89.3% of all of the um, uh, distributions from that fund go to K through 12 uh, schools. So it's an important fund. Uh, I've worked with now four treasurers and uh, we've had excellent investment results. So uh, that's my background. Um, uh, I'm a chartered financial analyst. Um, uh, and that's, so what I do during my day is I manage clients' portfolios and I work with our research staff at our firm to identify things that we think are attractive to invest in. And then we take those attractive investments and we, we um, uh, use those to build portfolios for our clients. So I'm uh, uh, looking at um, valuing companies, trying to determine if companies are overvalued, undervalued, or fairly valued. And, um, and then with that information, we build appropriate portfolios for our clients. Uh, Brad told you uh, we were going to have some fun with uh, uh, actuarial sciences. So uh, next up, we're going to have to. I'm going to have to have Mark find the slide, but we're going to have some fun with finance right now. Uh, I'm going to show you a report about a company, and at the top of the page, I have scratched out the name of the company. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, removed the names to protect the innocent. And uh, we've got some pretty small numbers here. I'm going to ask Mark if he can move his cursor over to the third line down that shows the earnings per share. So earnings per share in 2012 were at this company. We'll call it Acme Enterprises. Maybe they're the ones that uh, sold uh, uh, the Roadrunner, all those, uh, uh, all those novelties that uh, uh, turned out to explode. In any event, we, in 2012, they earned $3.17 a share. The next year, 2013, they earned 298, followed by 347, 378, 340. Things were going swimmingly from 2012 to 2016. And you can see from the stock chart on the top, the stock was doing pretty well. Then something happened. In 2017, they only made 31 cents. Their earnings declined 90%. Say, that's uh, a shame. And in 2018, 
not only did they not make 31 cents, they lost, the D means a loss of $6.59. Something happened. Uh, in 2019, they lost $5.38. We don't know the answer for 2020, but they appear to have lost about $2. And looking forward, I wouldn't say the prospects are particularly good. If we go down to the sales line and look at uh, 2017, their revenue was about $9.2 billion. In 2018, the revenue was $8.3 billion. In 2019, the revenue was $6.4 billion. And uh, similarly, um, things are not going very well with this company. And uh, this has led, so there are uh, lots of different ways you can make investments. If you have a stock that you think is doing well, uh, Microsoft, for example, just hit a new all-time high today. I think people at Microsoft are really on to something. I think it's a wonderful company. In any event, um, if you liked Microsoft, you could buy it. And, uh, and if it goes up, you'd be very happy. If you had a, a company like this that was not doing very well, uh, you might anticipate that it might do worse going forward. It might not even survive. And it, you, there is a way to profit from that. You have to be right, of course, but you could borrow some shares. When this report was printed on January 15th, the stock price was $17.25 a share. You could have gone to your friendly brokerage firm and borrowed a thousand shares. Um, and the value of that would be $17,250. And um, you, you could have borrowed those shares, sold them immediately, gotten the $17,250, and if you thought the stock price would go down, uh, later on when it say went to $7.25 a share, well, you'd take some of that money and buy those thousand shares back for $7,250, give the shares back to the brokerage firm that you borrowed them from, and you'd be $10,000 better off. That's called shorting stocks. It's exquisitely dangerous. Uh, nobody should really be doing that. If you're going to do that, you better know what you're doing. And um, the problem is if the stock goes up from 1725 to 2725, then it's going to cost you $27,250 to buy that stock back to, to return it to its owner. So uh, if the stock went up dramatically, you could have really unlimited losses. And this is where hedge funds come in. Uh, most investors, uh, take a portfolio like the PSPRS portfolio, and we could invest it all in stocks. We could borrow some money and invest even more than 100% in stocks. Nobody thinks that's a particularly good idea. So there should be a balance, but um, uh, hedge funds are managers that will not only buy some stocks that they like, uh, maybe even 100% of their fund, but they might simultaneously short 40 or 50% of the assets in their fund, um, the amount of assets. And as a result, if the market goes up, the things that they are long on will go up, but the things that they're short on, uh, they'll lose money. And it will mean that in an up market, the, the fund won't do quite as well as the market. In a down market, the stocks that they're long will go down, but the stocks that they're short should go up and that should minimize their losses. So this is what hedge funds typically try to do. And there are hedge funds that are broadly uh, diversified, and there are some that are highly concentrated in just a few holdings. And this is a stock that has become all the rage over the last two or three weeks. And uh, what's happened is the people that shorted this stock figured, well, things are going so badly at the company, it'll probably go down. And if it doesn't go down, it can't go up very much. Well, this was $17.25 a share on January 15th. Last Wednesday, the price of this stock was $500 a share. And um, that's how the short sellers um, lost an enormous amount of money. There's one hedge fund that lost over half of their money during the month of January because of this. And it was really a dramatic increase it was, would have been hard to figure, uh, and it be, it's because all the Robinhood traders uh, piled into this stock and bought it. Now, unfortunately for the Robinhood traders, 
somebody paid $500 a share for it. In order for them to profit, the hedge fund that was short lost an enormous amount of money and they've really been damaged. And frankly, they deserve it. I'm no fan of hedge funds or short sellers, but um, the, for the Robinhood traders that bought the stock at 400 or 380 or 500, they've temporarily pushed the stock price up. It's not sustainable. And for them to make a profit, they have to get out. So if they bought it on the way up at 200, they better have sold it at 300 or 400. If they still have it today, it's back to 100. I think most of them are going to lose all of their money. And that's really a shame. Anyway, I thought this might be interesting. Um, if anybody would like to know the name of this company, it's, uh, it's called GameStop. And uh, hopefully that'll give you some insight into uh, what's going on in today's environment. Uh, so much for fun with finance. Um, uh, the, the next thing I did want to tell people, uh, you may see a guy in a pinstripe suit with a tie here. Um, the, uh, the reason I'm here is because Phoenix, Arizona, for me, is a better place to live because uh, firefighters, police officers, judges, elected officials are busy at work. And uh, um, uh, I know we've got many members on the call today, and I just wanna uh, tell you how much we appreciate your service and uh, let you know that I believe Phoenix, Arizona is a better place to live if you can call 911 if you need to and somebody will be there. So uh, I take your, your service very seriously and uh, I take your pension very seriously. And um, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to try to improve the investment management uh, and try to make it as, as successful as possible so that we can get this, uh, this fund fully funded as soon as possible. And um, hopefully that will, over time, uh, as Brad said, reduce a lot of the costs of providing these pension benefits. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about investment management and governance. Um, the investment committee and the board, we're not making individual investments. We're not uh, telling uh, staff or our consultants what to invest in or who to invest with. We are, um, uh, we are tasked with oversight, primarily on asset allocation, investment policies and compliance. And uh, the biggest single decision we help the system make is the asset allocation. And uh, you'll see in some slides in the future, um, it, it, the returns historically that we've gotten from stocks versus bonds versus real estate versus private equity, they're very different. And from time to time, uh, one of these asset classes is um, a better investment opportunity than the others. We spend a lot of time working with staff and working with our consultants to get the asset allocation right. The asset allocation decision typically drives 80 or 90% of the total return that the fund earns. That's what we need to focus on. So we do this with the help of our staff and also outside consultants. We have the main consultant, the fiduciary consultant, which is New England Consultants. Our uh, consultant, uh, our actual consultant is Alan Martin. He's one of seven principals at that company. It's a big company. They have about a trillion dollars under uh, uh, management and Alan's one of the seven principals. So we get uh, a unique amount of insight and um, attention because of Alan's presence. He's been with us a long time and he's done a great job for us. Uh, he works hand in hand with staff um, and in addition with the, uh, with the other uh, consultants. Um, our staff consists of a chief investment officer, that's Mark Steed that you saw earlier and who's driving the slides. We have three portfolio managers, four analysts, three operations staff and uh, investment counsel and a paralegal. Um, some people might say, why do you need all of this? We'll touch on that in the future uh, as we get a little further. But uh, basically, if we were just buying, putting 60% of our money in the Standard Poor's 500 and 40% of our money in short-term bonds, we wouldn't need Allen, 
we wouldn't need a high, uh, the, the highly skilled and trained and experienced investment staff. Uh, we, we call that plain vanilla. It would be easy to implement and it would be less expensive. It wouldn't meet our needs. Um, it might be appropriate for the Arizona Board of Investment uh, for the state permanent fund, but it would not be appropriate for PSPRS. It would likely cause even wider swings in annual contribution rates. And if a police officer uh, has to contribute more of her paycheck to the pension, it sure feels like a pay cut. And uh, I don't know too many people that can afford that. So there's a reason we're doing this. So um, uh, in conjunction with our general consultant and our staff, we have three specialty consultants. We've kind of grown up with these organizations. The first one is Stepstone Global. They're out of San Diego. When PSPRS started with them, they were small. They're not small anymore. They have $130 billion under management and they have offices all over the world. Uh, they're, they're very capable and uh, their specialty is private equity. And this is where uh, the fund, uh, the, the system uh, invests in a fund that owns a series of private investments, things that are not public. Typically they're things that might go public. One of them was Yeti that did really well for us. Um, Allborn Partners um, helps us with our hedge funds. They're a large organization uh, they're based out of London, and they are advisors to uh, more than 40 large public pension plans. They're very sophisticated, very knowledgeable. Hedge fund managers, by and large, are not nice people. Uh, you have to be very careful with them. And if you're going to use hedge funds, you better have somebody advising you that knows what they're doing. The next uh, uh, specialty consultant is ORG Realty Partners. Uh, they're out of um, uh, Cleveland, um, and they focus on real estate. They've done a superb job. Real estate is a, uh, uh, a big deal issue to PSPRS. We have different kinds of real estate. ORG helps us invest in funds that are highly diversified. We don't own just one building or one piece of property or one hotel. Um, one, of the, uh, one of our advisors helped us buy uh, a, a portion of the Apple store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. I think that's a pretty good investment. Um, in any event, PSPRS has historically also owned uh, individual pieces of property, primarily in Arizona or the Southwest. Um, I don't think anybody's read the newspapers. I don't think I have to tell you that uh, those investments have been pretty disappointing over the years. I'm happy to tell you that ORG has helped us uh, hook us up with one of our managers, Miller Global, uh, who has taken over responsibility to uh, manage the remaining joint venture properties. They're doing a very good job. Um, uh, I've spent a lot of time and effort on this, uh, along with Mark Steed and many of his staff, outside counsel, uh, the ORG folks, the Miller Global folks, and our former trustee, Will Bouvedas, was also very helpful in that transition. And uh, I'm delighted to tell you that historically, the joint venture real estate has been a drag on, or, or on performance. Um, I don't think that's gonna be the case going forward. Uh, we're pretty optimistic. And uh, we've also reduced the size of the portfolio. Diversification matters a lot. And we're in a much better condition at this point. Uh, let's move on to the, oh, there we go. Um, the investment committee, uh, again, um, uh, asset allocation um, and investment policy. Uh, we have monthly public meetings. Anybody can zoom in. Um, there's, there's nothing hidden. Uh, I don't think we've gone into executive session very often. Occasionally when we're negotiating with a particular manager or we have something that's uh, sensitive or proprietary, we have to go into executive session, but that, that almost never happens. So if you wanna know the exact details of what the asset allocation is, why we're changing that, what do we think the market conditions are, please come join us. We'd love to have you. 
Uh, so in the monthly public meetings, it's all transparent. Uh, we review the performance of the trust and the cancer insurance portfolio. We'll go over a model, uh, an example of that in a few minutes. We also look at the risk report. It's not enough to know that you won the football game. We need to know how you won. Did the opposing team's quarterback uh, and tight end get sick? Well, maybe that's why you won. I'm not, I don't want to just win. I want to know how we won. I want to know the risks that we took. And I want to know what could happen if something goes wrong. That's our risk report. And we have a very talented manager uh, that produces that for us monthly. Uh, we also look at capital market developments uh, for uh, the major financial markets, equities, currency, commodities, things like that, bonds. And uh, we look at that every month and we look for outliers. We look for uh, things that have gone way down for some reason or they've gone way up for, for some reason. We don't look specifically at an industry, but if you looked at airline stocks um, over the last year, you would find that something happened to their business and it wasn't good. Now, if something goes down for a good reason, then we probably don't wanna to touch that. But if something goes down for a silly reason or a temporary reason, there might be an opportunity. Similarly, if something goes shooting up like GameStop, uh, we might look at that and say, that's crazy. We need to reduce our exposure there. So that's what we look for with the uh, capital markets development uh, uh, developments and um, looking at the major asset classes. We also review executed transactions each month. Again, there's plenty of transparency. Nobody's going to buy or sell anything without giving disclosure. Um, in our quarterly meetings, we have a performance review and attribution. Again, that dissects uh, where are the risks being taken um, how are we doing compared to uh, 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 benchmarks or uh, others in the industry? Um, and uh, that is prepared by, by our independent <coughs> consultant, NEPC. We also review a compliance report to make sure that staff is operating within the guidelines that, uh, the, uh, of the policy that is set by the Board of Trustees and the Investment Committee and um, any deviations are followed up and explained and uh, dealt with promptly. Uh, we also look at longer term trends in investment management. Uh, we want to adhere to best practices. If somebody's got a better idea, we want to hear about it. We may not do it, but we'd at least like to consider it. And then we have uh, annual public meetings. Uh, we review the asset allocation and the investment policy statement for board approval. Uh, we also set the assumed earnings rate. For tiers one and two, the rate is 7.3%. For tier three, the rate is 7%. Over the last several years, that rate's been coming down. Some people would tell us that rate's too high. Uh, we feel pretty comfortable with it at this point. Again, as Brad pointed out, that's not what we expect to earn this year. That's what we expect to earn on average over the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 80 years. Uh, so it's a very long-term uh, uh, scenario. I can tell you right now what a 10-year bond yields, about 1.1%. I can't tell you what the average yield on a 10-year treasury will be over the next 50 years. Over the last uh, 50 years, it's averaged more like 4%. Um, so uh, this year, it earns 1.1%. I don't know what it'll earn 30 years from now. But if I had to guess, I'd take... I'd, take something closer to the long-term average. Um, so um, uh, we've done a lot of work in 2020. Uh, you heard from Brad earlier, we looked at the cash flow projections um, and that helped us come up with uh, understanding the kind of risk we can take in terms of our asset allocation, a little higher asset allocation to risk assets where hopefully we'll, we'll get a little higher return. That's really important, but yet we still have to feel comfortable that if something goes wrong, we're not gonna have wild gyrations in terms of uh, required contributions. Um, this is pretty unique uh, research and it combines both the investment uh, team and the uh, actuarial team. It's, uh, Brad is a good actuary. 
It is fun working with them and uh, we're doing great work. Uh, the investment policy and asset allocation changes. I think you're probably all aware that the proposition 124 and 125 replaced the PBI, the uh, permanent benefit increase. Essentially, before Proposition 124 and 125, if we had a really great year, uh, a good bit of the return went to increase benefits, even though we're quite underfunded. In a bad year, uh, where we have a loss, all of the loss goes directly to the system. So it wasn't balanced, it wasn't symmetrical. And because of that, we had a huge incentive and prior boards correctly took less risk because if, if, you, if you play uh, uh, roulette and you win and you only get half of the winnings, but if you lose, you get all of the losses, that's an even better reason not to pay, play roulette. And that was what this board was facing. And that's why the previous boards correctly and previous staff took less risk. That's unfortunate because the markets have done well the last 10 years. Uh, in any event, that's fixed. Um, we also uh, uh, found that the long-term risk allowed us to take a little more aggressive approach and, uh, and, and accept a little less liquidity and marketability. And that's helped us increase. Um, we've increased public equity a lot and we've increased pi private equity a good bit. You'll see that in a few minutes. Um, the other things that we did is uh, we reviewed the external uh, investment consultants and um, they're doing well for us, but uh, no offense guys, we're gonna keep uh, taking a look and see if we might be better off bringing some of that in-house. Uh, for right now, I doubt it, but down the road, uh, we're open-minded and we're not just gonna keep doing what we were doing. We have to have best practices. We have to make sure we're right, that we're doing the best we can. Um, so pr another project, um, uh, some of you may be aware that the chief investment officer at CalPERS was terminated because he uh, violated some uh, uh, internal trading policies. Uh, we, uh, we are revamping uh, the uh, trading and conflict of interest policies, both for our staff, but also for our board of trustees. Uh, again, credibility, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, is really important and uh, we, we can't have conflicts of interest. I'm here, I don't need this job. Uh, I'm here because I wanna do good things for the state of Arizona and the wonderful people that are providing service and the wonderful uh, municipalities and, and, uh, uh, and counties and the, and, the, and the state government uh, that, that uh, funds these pensions. That's what I'm here for. Um, so transparency is really important. Um, and uh, uh, let's move to the next slide, Mark. Okay, here's a sample of the investment committee overview. And what this does, these are tiny numbers, but uh, it's a monthly snapshot of how do each of our asset classes, how did they do in the most recent month? We have the most recent month, the uh, most recent quarter, uh, year to date, calendar year to date, all kinds of different time periods, one year, three years, five years, 10 years. And of course, these change over time and managers come and go. So uh, you have to know what you're looking at uh, when you look at this report. And particularly in periods like last year when we saw such volatility, things went down dramatically in February and March and then they shot back up. Um, and, and so uh, some of our benchmarks are uh, for non-marketable securities. And when you, and the, the benchmarks are marketable. So the markets can move quickly. If the uh, non-public assets don't move quickly, it's not a, very, very, not a very fair comparison. So over a three or five year period, that's not a problem. But when you're watching monthly or quarterly, you have to know what you're looking at. And um, I'll, I'll be, uh, trust me, um, our consultants, our investment staff, and the investment committee, as long with, uh, along with the rest of the PSPRS staff, we know this report inside and out. We know when uh, th there's a deviation that's uh, just an artifact of, uh, of uh, short-term volatility, 
or alternatively, if it indicates that there's a real problem where some action should be taken. So we've got our finger on the pulse, uh, no less frequently than monthly. Next up is the investment committee overview on um, uh, risk. And what this does is we look and we dissect the risk that the portfolio is taking. Uh, is there a risk that oil prices go up? Is there a risk that interest rates go up or inflation? Is there a risk that the stock market goes down? Is there a risk that defaults go up? We look at all kinds of risks. We also look at scenario analysis where we try to say, okay, what happened September 11, 2001? Well, it wasn't very good. Is that going to happen again? God, I hope not. Um, is some, but is it possible that something different, still bad, same order of magnitude might happen? Yeah, it is. And it is useful to say, you know, hypothetically, if something like that happened again, what do you suppose would happen to our portfolio? And um, uh, in actuality, September 11th, this, this the fund, long before most of us were here, was down 11%. With the portfolio we have now, we expect that if a similar order of magnitude event occurred, we'd be down 3.2%, a lot less risk. We've changed the portfolio a lot. So you can see all these unfortunate things that have happened, and you can see what would likely happen to us. And you can see that today's portfolio, the, the uh, potential damage is very, very different than what the actual damage was historically. We've improved these portfolios enormously. We also look at um, uh, market reporting. Uh, the bottom line in red is energy. If anybody's filled up their tank lately, and why would you fill up your tank? Nobody goes anywhere. By the way, if nobody goes anywhere and nobody fills up their tank, hey, what's gonna happen to demand for gasoline or diesel fuel or jet fuel? Uh, it's going to go way down and everything else the same. What's going to happen to the price? And if you've got the same uh, 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 supply and demand goes way down, chances are pretty good price is going to go down a lot. Uh, so you see different uh, sectors. Information technology has done the best. Real estate hasn't fared very well. Neither have financials, but energy's really been bad. So again, this helps us and we don't just look at S&P 500 market sectors, we look at commodities, we look at uh, futures, uh, currencies, a variety of things that we might invest in. Mark, let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's our asset allocation. Boy, is this carved up into a lot of pieces. Um, U.S. public equity, uh, a blue, uh, almost a quarter on the top. U.S. public equity is almost entirely indexed. What does that mean? We own something similar to the S&P 500. How will it do? Well, it'll do about as well as the S&P 500. Why? Because that's what we own. Uh, how much does it cost to manage that? Almost nothing. We're really conscious about fees. And U.S. public equity, we've increased a lot, and uh, we've had great returns. And I am so proud of our staff. The time periods that they actually increase the allocation to uh, U.S. public equities, in hindsight, turned out to be almost perfectly correct. They bought low. They're, they've done a really good job, and uh, we all have benefited as a result. We've also uh, expanded international public equity. It's, uh, it's a little more expensive, but it's still cheap compared to the other categories. And you can see now the two of them together, we've been able to add, uh, add to equity exposure as a result of the propositions 124 and 125 doing away with the PBI. So you can see we've got 40% in pretty cheap stuff. And uh, this is similar to most other large public pension plans. Next over, we've got buyouts and venture capital. Um, these are uh, private equity and uh, they are much more expensive. They're more complex, but they're not perfectly correlated with public markets. And so that diversification helps lower our overall risk. If we can buy different chunks that are not highly correlated with each other, we can reduce the overall risk under most scenarios. Uh, real estate assets, we talked about that before. Um, this is mainly uh, large diversified uh, pools and a few uh, joint venture pieces left. Oh, I'm sorry, that's real assets. 
Real assets are primarily commodities. Typically, that's oil and gas, timber, other things like that. Those have not done very well as of late. On the other hand, if we get some inflation because of massive Federal Reserve stimulus and massive uh, fiscal stimulus, those may do a lot better. Those you could find on our outlier chart that they're relatively inexpensive today. Real estate, uh, that's what I spoke to. There's 8% in there. Core bonds. If you looked at large public pension plans over the last 50 years, you'd see core bonds made up 30 or 35%, maybe 40% sometimes. Here it makes up 1%. Well, here's the value proposition. If I invest a uh, uh, million dollars in a, a one-year treasury, I'm going to earn 1.1%. If, if I invest in a 30-year treasury, which is exquisitely dangerous, uh, I'm going to earn 1.8%. And if I tell Brad, if I put a large chunk of my portfolio in assets that I know will not earn, not earn any more than 1.8%, he's going to come back to me and tell me, well, there's no way you're going to earn 7.3%. So we better lower your assumed rate to four or 5%. And if we do that, a funny thing happens. All of a sudden, our unfunded pension liability goes up dramatically, not by a billion or two, more like five or 10 billion. And if that happens, guess what happens to contributions? They go up dramatically. So we literally can't put much money in bonds today because they're unproductive. We can put money in private equity or private lending and private credit, special credit. So you can see there's 16% in other fixed incomes. They just don't happen to be core bonds anymore. We're adjusting to market conditions. That's really important. The remainders are diversifying strategies. Uh, a lot of people would refer to those primarily as hedge funds and related entities. We've been uh, reducing that over time. Um, they are there as diversifiers. Uh, they're not as closely correlated with these other assets. And we have about 3% in cash. So um, I hope the takeaway that you'll have from this is we know what's in this portfolio. We've been moving it around based on market conditions and based on Prop 124, 125. We know what we're doing and we're being very careful with this. We want the highest total return we can get but we have to control the level of risk so we don't have crazy changes in contribution rates. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. It's uh, produced uh, by a group called Ibbotson. Uh, and uh, what it shows is how various asset classes have performed over a very long period of time. Um, it's a busy slide. On the bottom, you can see various events that have affected markets, but um, uh, essentially, over the last approximately 90 years, um, the green line shows what would have happened if you invested in the money market fund. If you had $1 in 1926, paid no taxes, no fees, and reinvested the interest, that $1 would have become worth $22 at the end of 2017, I guess. And um, the yellow line shows what would have happened if you had 30-year bonds about that $1 would have become worth $150. The light blue line shows what would have happened with large company stocks, $9,000. And the dark blue line is small company stocks, $39,000. What's important is not the terminal numbers, but the compound annual rates you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, basically, the treasury bills or money market fund, about 3.3%. Government bonds, about 5.5%. Stocks, 10 to 12%. So we want to put as much in stocks or things like stocks to get the higher total return, but we are limited by the risk we can take. So a historical 60-40 split between stocks and bonds, if you earn 10% in stocks and you had 60% of your portfolio in stocks, that would contribute 600 basis points to your return. If you put 40% in bonds at 5.5%, that would contribute 220 basis points. So you'd have a nominal return of 8.2%, lop off eight tenths of a percent for fees and expenses. What do you know? You're at 7.3%. But um, 
these asset classes historically produced this. They don't anymore. Let's move to the next slide. This is what NEPC tells us their projection is, and also BlackRock, the world's largest mutual fund manager. Um, these are their expectations for the next 10 years from various asset classes. U.S. large cap equities, 6.6 .6 or 5.8. Know this, both are under 7.3%. U.S. private equity, they might be wrong, but they're saying 10.9 or 12.1%. Looks interesting. Higher risk, very much more expensive. You better know what you're doing. Private lending, same, uh, uh, same constraints there. You better know what you're doing, but 8% or 8.9%. It's a, it's, a, it's a good place to fish because the fishing is good there, or at least we think it will be. Uh, emerging market equity, these are Chinese stocks and Korean stocks. They're a lot more risky, but the potential's a little better. They're both above, they're at 7.3 or above. U.S. real estate, again, they might be wrong, but they're expecting four and a half or 6.3%. Both don't equal 7.3. And then we've got poor U.S. government bonds, six tenths of a percent or three tenths of a percent. This is why we have 1% of our money in core bonds. Uh, European equities, 7.5 or 7.1%. Let's go to the next slide. Next up, I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Mark Steed. Uh, he's chief investment officer. Um, uh, when I came to the board. Harry, we, this is Christian. I think it's a good time. Uh, we were scheduled to take a quick five minute break at, uh, at 125. Um, I think we should uh, allow our audience a quick five minute break for picking it up, if that's okay. Sounds great. Very again, I'm just going to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Mark Steed. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough to be chairman of the investment committee when uh, we went out to, uh, to look, look to fill this position. Uh, his predecessor retired and uh, we did a full blown national search. And I am delighted to tell you we made a great selection and uh, I would hold Mark up against any CIO at any public pension plan. Um, and uh, uh, some of, he's got a master's in predictive in, uh, analytics from Northwestern. He's been named asset allocator of the year by institutional investor, a rising star. He's a little young. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of gray hair yet. Uh, if he stays around PSPRS another 20 years, he'll have gray hair. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, he's done a super job. He leads our team, and uh, I really enjoy working with him. Uh, he's going to take you through the rest of the slides here. And, um, and then I think the two of us are going to take questions uh, for the rest of our time. So, Mark, take it away. Great. Thanks, Harry. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, you know, to your earlier point about you know, sympathy for hedge funds. I'll just add that I don't think anyone should feel sympathetic for the hedge funds. Like, you know, for those that are trying to be intellectually honest um, and look for the, you know, a way to, to feel bad for the hedge funds that got squeezed on GameStop. Um, let me just say, I, I don't think you should, or if you should, it's like you should play the world's smallest violin. Um, at any rate, I, you know, I think we're lucky to have trustee Pap. Uh, he's, he's credentialed. He manages a billion dollars. And I think our constituents should feel, um, you know, very comfortable with him at the helm of the committee. In fact, the committee is probably the, the most uh, credentialed and professional we've had since I've been here. So uh, I'm really happy about that. Um, I'm gonna skip um, through my background. I appreciate the intro from Harry. And uh, I think that's a slide that my mom wrote. Uh, let me just start here by you know, looking, um, looking back and, and just recap performance. I know a lot of this has been covered already and then I'll look forward. And you know, the punchline is I'm, I'm very happy to say, as uh, Harry mentioned, that almost all of the changes we've implemented have been very positive uh, over uh, almost, I think, overwhelmingly so. So, but first let's review performance. Uh, I you know this has been said, but I feel like, um, you know, we should, you know, officially you know, talk about this and, and give people the chance to ask questions when I'm, when I'm done. But the trust finished fiscal year 20 up 1%, bringing the seven year performance, which is the, the time period that our actuary uses to smooth returns to 6.8%. Uh, through November, uh, performance is up 11.56, bringing the seven year to 7.22. And I'm happy to report, oh, this isn't uh, public yet, but we were up almost 
3% in December, bringing performance to about 14.5% through 1231 for the fiscal year. Are we doing any better than any of the other funds that people might be <laughs> in? Yeah, well, I, I didn't, I don't have a, I didn't go out and get a tattoo that said 14 and a half percent, but it is, it is higher than some of the other, uh, you know, plans in the state. Um, but, you know, we're halfway through the fiscal year. Uh, so hopefully, you know, hopefully those numbers hold. So uh, there's a lot on the left side of this slide. I won't go through that in a lot of detail. That's mostly because I thought you all would be kind of reading and reviewing these. And there might be some more detail there to the left that you care about. Uh, but 2019, uh, you know, for those who, our new was my first full year uh, as a new CIO. And we have uh, now a new IC, including Chairman Pap. Uh, and in 2019, we began moving the portfolio from a more defensive position to uh, you know, an offensive one. Asset allocation on the right is a function of the system's cash flows, meaning when, when is it that you need money and risk, uh, meaning how much volatility can you, can you stomach? All the changes uh, covered this morning with uh, Administrator Townsend, uh, Brad Heinrichs, and, and, and Trustee Papp, uh, in terms of changing the cash flows and uh, uh, the impact of portfolio volatility on contribution rates, have uh, impacted when we need money and uh, exactly what kind of volatility is acceptable. And when those two factors change, the portfolio changes. So you can see on the left, we have the asset allocation in 2018. 630 on the right, we have the asset allocation as of 630, 2020. What we've changed, anything in blue is what we generally refer to as capital appreciation. That's where you hold a security and somebody needs to buy it from you for more than you paid for it. And they're generally correlated to economic growth. Anything in orange is, is an income oriented strategy. And then gray is, uh, is diversifying. So you can see what we've changed over time is emphasized capital appreciation. That's that offensive aspect. We've taken money out of real assets, out of real estate, out of core bonds, and out of diversifying strategies. And how are, I guess the question is, how are we doing with this? As of 630, uh, those changes added 60 million in value add relative to the 2018 portfolio. And through November, they've added 250 million in value add relative to the 2018 portfolio. And while we're happy about that, there are still legacy assets to work out, uh, as Trustee Pab mentioned, not just in uh, Arizona real estate, but also some in uh, power and energy. And those will take time to work out. What do we expect uh, going forward? We expect the current portfolio today to generate around 7.9%. That was as of 630, 2020, over the next 10 years and 8.4% over the next 30 years. That's down on the bottom left, in case you're trying to follow along. In terms of how we get to that number on the right, I provided more detail in terms of the long-term return expectations that we have for various asset classes. Trustee Papp covered a few of them um, of just a few slides ago. And here we provide more detail. We start by analyzing, like I said, the cash flows of the system to determine our time horizon. And then as Brad Heinrichs explained, understanding how volatility impacts contribution rates. Then the trust fiduciary consulting, which is any PC, provides expected returns. Those are on the right for each of the asset classes. And then we aggregate those up to determine what we should expect for the portfolio over the next, uh, you know, in this case, 10 years. I'll just touch on two other um, items, which I think will be covered in more detail shortly. Uh, I think in the, uh, in the second day, uh, Clark Partridge, my colleague, will give an excellent presentation on, on what employers can do. Uh, and what, or what they are doing in terms of taking advantage of the low rate environment uh, to pay off their unfunded liabilities. And I think there may be a discussion about 115 trusts uh, also. I'll just, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, there's, there's a lot that's been said about extra contributions. And, I, and I'm often asked what happens to the money when it comes in. And, you know, first I'll just say that the extra cash is not a problem for us. We're able to consume that just in the regular day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, cash flows of the portfolio. When, you make an extra contribution effectively what you're doing. The key takeaway is the last bullet point on this page. You're making contributions and you're increasing your share of the trust um, income. So you buy into an existing portfolio. So that, that's a question we get very often is what happens, what, is, what happens with my money? It buys into the share of the portfolio that we have, which asset allocation we explained just a, a few slides ago. 
The other, uh, the other tool that's come out uh, recently, and there's been a couple of employers uh, who have been extremely active, and we appreciate their, you know, their help and their guidance um, in, in raising this and, and helping us vet these opportunities, but our 115 trusts. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. It's not necessarily um, something that my team handles at PSPRS, but I will mention that you can set these trusts up. They're irrevocable. Uh, you can contribute capital to the trusts. You, as an employer, maintain control over the underlying investments. It doesn't offset um, any unfunded liability until the money is transferred to the trust, which is, again, is at the election of the employer. Uh, we've issued an RFP, and we're currently reviewing those responses. We expect we'll have a board decision in terms of a uh, vendor in the March to April timeframe. So hopefully um, that, that, that does it for my review. I want it to be brief. I know that there are lots of people attending this, uh, you know, this, this conference that have a lot of experience with this and are very sophisticated. Um, I, I probably talked down to them and there are lots of other people who don't have any experience with, with you know, investment portfolios and asset allocation. And, and maybe we said too much, but I wanted to pause there and uh, see if we have any questions. If not, we thought we would, um, you know, Harry and I would talk more casually about what's going on in the markets. Um, and maybe Harry, I'll put you on the spot. Um, Mark, you know, we'll, we, do, we do have a uh, question. Oh yeah, go for it. We'll start uh, we have a question in the queue here. Uh, given that a lot of employers are considering using this uh, low interest financing to pay down their unfunded liabilities, could you explain uh, the process and approach that is undertaken when those funds are going to be invested? Let me speak to that. I think that's really important. And um, um, there are some things that employers need to understand. And uh, City of Flagstaff has, uh, has had a lot of help from Mike Townsend over the years. They really get it. Um, and I'll just tell you, uh, when you buy a new city hall or a new fire truck and you write a check and you have to borrow that money to buy the fire truck from the bank, that's debt. When you issue bonds to build a, a road or a city hall, th those bonds are debt. When you promise a firefighter or a police officer a pension, you are taking on an obligation and that's debt. No different, it not, may not be currently funded, but it's no different than issuing bonds to build a new firehouse or borrowing money from the bank to buy a new fire truck. And this is an obligation of that entity. And so is the pension. And uh, as a result, one of, the, one of the discussions we have is, oh my God, I don't wanna take out any more additional debt um, because I've already got so much debt. I don't wanna take out any more debt to pay down my pension. Well, here's the message. As long as you intend to pay that pension, that pension is debt. No different than if it's a municipal bond or a loan from the bank. Some of you out there may have a mortgage. I hope not. I hope you all won the lottery and you paid off your mortgage. But if you have a mortgage, and particularly if you have a 7.3% mortgage, I got news for you. Mortgage rates today are about 3%. And if you could take that 3%, if you could take that 7.3% mortgage and refinance it at 3%, I gotta tell you, I think that's a good idea. And that's what the city of Flagstaff has done. And that's what a number of other employers have done. And the key takeaway is that pension is debt. No, all we're doing is refinancing it to a lower level. Am I sure I can earn 7.3% a year? I can't tell you with certainty. I hope so. We're sure going to try, but I got news for you. If I can't earn 2.7% on average over the long term, there's all kinds of things in the United States of America that are not going to work. So uh, I think your best chance is going out and issue bonds currently, not new bonds. Don't spend the money on something else. Use those bonds, issue those bonds to get cash, to put in PSPRS. And even if we only earn 5.3%, I think we'll do better than that, but we'll still be better than 2.7%. And you'll have an arbitrage profit there. That's really important. Now, the particular question is, if City of Flagstaff borrows a million, $100 million, what is Mark going to do with it? He's going to throw that in the mix, mm -hmm. and some of it will end up in large uh, uh, U.S. stocks. Some will end up in foreign stocks. Some will end up in private equity. 
there's stuff coming and going all the time. There's bonds that pay off. There's private equity that call, makes capital calls. We can easily put money in and out of, uh, of uh, large company, uh, 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 U.S. stocks, foreign stocks. So essentially, it's like buying into a mutual fund. If, uh, uh, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to own the Standard & Poor's 500 index fund, and all of a sudden you put a billion dollars into it, you're going to own a proportionate interest of everything that's in there right now. And with all the money that's coming and going with making payments and uh, payments coming in, we can easily accommodate that. And it's not going to change our, our asset allocation to any significant uh, 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 amount. So please don't be worried that if you go out and borrow $100 billion, Mark's going to put it all in Chinese stocks or uh, private equity. You're going to own an undivided interest in an existing portfolio that's large and diversified. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. I don't have anything to add. Mark, you can continue. Yeah, great. thanks, Christian. Um, and yeah, and feel free. I'm trying to check the chat here, but I, I take that some of you might be sending questions in through some other uh, you know some other forum. But you know, Harry, one thing that's been an active uh, topic. In the investment committee that I get out, you know, I, and I get asked personally a lot about that is inflation, right? Um, what happens? You know, we've we had all the the stimulus from 2008 and nine, both fiscal and monetary stimulus. Now there's a new round, uh, more monetary and fiscal stimulus. Uh, we haven't seen inflation for the last ten years, um, but now people are wondering if if we're at that point, right? And I know we've had active debates about that, but you know, uh, our constituents get to hear me pretty regularly. How about how about you tell us? how you view that and, and what you think about the inflation picture and how you'd advise people. Thank you, that's a great question. And the answer appears on page A17 of the Wall Street Journal this morning in an op-ed piece. So I would call everybody's attention to that. And uh, if we're allowed to put that up later on, I'll ask Christian to, uh, to put that op-ed piece on. But uh, Mark's point is um, historically, uh, so I went to the University of Chicago uh, Milton Friedman was gone by the time I got there. He wrote this book called The Monetary History of the United States. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a Bible for people that study economics. And I'll, I'll just tell you that if you, in a very simplified manner, if you just immediately overnight doubled the money supply, and, and how would that be? Well, that would be you take a $20 bill out of your pocket, and then now it's a $40 bill. And a $10 bill is a $20 bill. And a $100 bill is a $200 bill. If we doubled the amount of money that everybody had, we'd still have the number of rounds of golf available at, uh, at the Phoenician. We'd still have the same number of hotel nights. We'd still have the same number of doctor's appointments. So in the short term, the economy has a relatively finite amount of goods and services and products. And if we double the money supply, what happens is people bid up the price of those assets. They say, well, you know, I'd have paid, it was, it was $60 to play golf. But now instead of a $100 bill in my pocket, I got a $200 bill in my pocket. I'm willing to pay $100 to play golf. And um, what happens is you have too much money chasing the same number of goods and that bids up the price, and we call that inflation. So there are two phenomena that are going on in a very big way right now. We have a massive federal deficit. Uh, when when uh, uh, George W. Bush came to the White House, our accumulated debt in the history of the country was $5 trillion. When he left, it was $10 trillion. He turned over the gavel to President Obama. He came in with $10 trillion. He left with 20 trillion. I'll just tell you it's 27 trillion now. So somehow in the last uh, 20 years, we've gone from 5 trillion to 27 trillion. That's pretty significant. And the trajectory is not looking good. So we have massive deficits uh, and, and a massive amount of debt. Right now, we don't have to worry too much about the debt because the interest rates are zero. As long as the interest rates are always zero, it won't be a problem. But the interest rates might not always be zero. We'll come back to that in a minute. 
The other thing that we're doing is the Federal Reserve is monetizing the debt. The, uh, uh, they're, they're buying most of the treasuries and lots of other debt. And by doing that, uh, the, the, uh, the, they're holding interest rates to zero, there is a high probability that they will rekindle inflation. Right now, they want inflation. They want it to get back to 2%. There's a variety of reasons for that. But uh, uh, you have to be careful what you ask for because 1% or 2% is fine. You get 3 or 4%. And all of a sudden, you show me a firefighter that's thinking about buying a new refrigerator for $1,000. And if he says, well, you know, if I put that $1,000 in the bank today, um, it's going to earn, well, it's going to earn nothing in the next year. Mm -hmm. And if there's 4% inflation or 3% inflation, that refrigerator is going to cost me more at the end of the year. And, and so uh, it's not really a very fair uh, return. What will happen in the long term if we get the inflation of two and a half, three percent, three and a half percent, even if it's short term in nature, what will happen is interest rates will go up. And um, uh, Jay Powell will be at the Federal Reserve will say, well, I just say interest rates on a 10 year treasury are one percent. And that's the way it is. And the bond market might very well say you can say whatever it is, whatever you want. If you want me to buy them. You better offer 4%. And, and that's what will happen if we get inflation that takes off. Now, we haven't had it the last 10 years. Everybody is poo-pooing folks like me that, said, that say, long term, this is a problem. They said, it hasn't been a problem in the last 10 years. The reason it hasn't been a problem is because of the changing nature of our economy and our world economy. The stuff we buy today uh, a lot of the things we buy are cell phones and computers. Those prices go down. A lot of things we import, that uh, tends to hold down prices, but it won't work forever. Basic laws of economics don't change uh, very quickly. So uh, we're very concerned in the long term about higher inflation, higher interest rates, and that will have a dramatic approach uh, impact on all of the asset classes we looked at earlier. So it's yeah. something you don't have to worry about so much today, but you know this is a plan that we're taking care of y'all for the next 80 years, and we have to factor that in. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. One, you know, one of the things that concerns me at least is, you know, I, I think by my math, the, the monetary package back in 08 was maybe 15% of GDP. The fiscal stimulus package, I think was 7%. In 2020, the monetary stimulus package was, I think, about 20%, and the fiscal stimulus was maybe 15%. So you have more stimulus and in a short amount of time, which makes, which I think concerns me in terms of how quickly these effects can show up. You know, <coughs> policies, I think, have unintended consequences. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but I think inflation is tough because when, and when it shows up, it's very, uh, it's very unpredictable, right? And you, and it's not so easy, I think, to target two or 3% inflation because if it gets a, if it gets out of control, it can quickly go, uh, you know, to five or ten percent. And um, you know, just for everybody listening, the way we think about that from a portfolio standpoint is, you know, that's something we put in a bucket where we have, you know, as we think about tactical allocation, you have kind of low conviction and high conviction, and then kind of a low payout and a high payout. And this is something where we have maybe high conviction, um, you know, that this is this is going to occur, and. You know, if you can catch it, depending on how you play it, it may be kind of a high-ish type of uh, you know, type of return. The qu the question is, if you if you have that trade on, right, and then it doesn't show up for five or six years, then you have you know an opportunity cost. I Meaning, if you invest in securities that perform well in inflation, that uh, if you don't have any inflation, you might earn a small marginal return, but you've given up maybe if you took the money out of something that was performing pretty well at the time, and. And so we've, we've been busy sort of researching how, to, how do we create this? How do we protect the portfolio? First, let's understand what its impact is because inflation is you know, poorly defined in a lot of cases. But then figure out how to structure a portfolio where we can minimize the opportunity cost if it's just a matter of duration. You know, if it comes in a year or five years, that can, that can severely impact whether the idea was a good one or a bad one. But um, speaking of sort of historical trends uh, over the last 10 years, Harry, um, you know, maybe it, the, other, the other sort of, theme that, uh, you know, that, or I say that, uh, you know, one strong theme the last 10 years is that, is that, is that the dollar has been very strong, right, uh, relative to all the other reserve currencies. 
And we're, I think we're only recently starting to see, I think the dollars maybe, maybe was down 12% in January, approximately. Um, what do you think about that? Because to some extent, you know, we're, fin we're financing our debt by issuing more debt. And we can do that because the global investors want to hold US dollars and US bonds, right? But as our currency depreciates, that becomes less and less attractive. Um, how do you, how, do you have a perspective on the dollar uh, and, and how you've seen sort of the US play out uh, in terms of a, you know, its, its spot competitively relative to some of the other developed countries? I sure do. Um, I think um, the US is a great place. Uh, it's a large economy. It is widely diversified. And for all of our problems, and God knows we've had them the last couple of months, but for our, all of our problems, we're a much more efficient and, uh, and better place to do business. Uh, capital markets are much deeper. Um, uh, regulation, as bad as it is, is uh, less uh, difficult than regulation in Japan or China or uh, Europe. Um, we're a wonderful place to do business. And that's part of the reason the dollar has been strong. Um, the, the dollar strength is important and the, the dollar being the world reserve currency is important because there are whole countries that use our currency as their currency, basically because their citizens don't trust their government to stand by their money. Um, I saw yesterday that Argentina, they were talking about Argentina's ninth default. I got to tell you, if, if a borrower comes to me and wants to borrow money, and I ask, you know, what's your history been? And they say, well, we've defaulted nine times. It's going to be a very short discussion because, I, you know, if you default nine times, I just don't care. I'm not going to do it. Um, so the question is, with all the uh, fiscal stimulus, all the monetary stimulus, will that uh, uh, cause, the, cause inflation here? I think that's likely. And uh, that uh, has, has led to some devaluation of the dollar. Um, to a degree, uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried that the, the, uh, the dollar uh, five years from now will buy less than today's dollar. We call that inflation. It's not all that clear to me that we will uh, devalue significantly uh, compared to some of these other currencies, the euro, the yen, the British pound, or the, the uh, Chinese currency. Uh, it is not all that clear. Um, the A uh, lot of things uh, uh, get impacted by this price of oil. Uh, price of oil is denominated in dollars. So when the dollar declines, it has a tendency to push the price of oil up. There are lots of products that uh, are globally sold in dollars. Even uh, things like semiconductors that are manufactured in Taiwan, uh, they're sold to people in Europe, uh, but they're sold in dollars. And uh, uh, so this is a pretty complicated uh, 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 series of relationships. But uh, over time, I think the U.S. dollar will, will lose some, some of its current strength as a reserve currency. And uh, I think other currencies will pick up some power there. And that will reduce our ability to trade foreign people um, uh, green pieces of paper for goods and services they produce. Mm -hmm. And um, as, long as, as long as I can print green pieces of paper and export them to China and they'll send me iPhones, that's a pretty good deal. So um, uh, in the very long term, and that's another problem we have if inflation were to take off, that's a, that would cause a lack of confidence in our currency. And to the extent that we can print green pieces of paper and exchange that for stuff we want. If we can't do that as much in the future, that is uh, not a good thing for yeah. our Harry, Mark, we have a question from the audience. Okay. Uh, what kind of private investments does PS Purist make? And I think the, the, the requester is, is seeking information on what sort of specific, I guess, industries or businesses or uh, opportunities uh, does PS Purist engage when they make investments in the private sector? Sure, I, I'll just I'll cover that um, briefly. Harry, you can jump in too. But you know the, the you know the way we see just private markets generally is um, it, they're a vital they're a vital piece of the U.S. economy, right? But I'll be the first to tell you, um, you know, you don't need to have 
uh, private equity in your portfolio to be, you know, efficient. You can you can probably manage without it, right? Uh, we have it. Uh, we haven't been harmed by it. It's added value over time, so we haven't incurred a, a, a cost that you know uh, from from doing sort of uh, private equity, which is really just investing in uh, companies that aren't publicly traded. And there are a lot of privately held companies. Uh, we're targeting companies that have, uh, I'd say, five to ten million dollars in earnings on the low low end, to about fifty to seventy five million in earnings on the high end. Above that, you know, you start to you you know. They, they could go public if they wanted to. So uh, the way we approach it is to say, you know, you want to have every option available from the portfolio perspective, because there are times when one, you know, public, public prices can get out of control, or sometimes this happens internationally a lot, where the constituents that make up the index for that country aren't really an accurate representation of, you know, the, those sectors that are contributing to economic output. So if you look at the, the companies that are, you know, held in uh, even the FTSE 100, which is, which is the UK, or, uh, you know, or the Chinese markets, you find that they're concentrated in certain sectors, and you may not want that, and they may not be representative of the economy. So we always like to have the ability to, to make private investments, because it's sometimes a better way to harness the growth opportunities. So from, that's, that's what we're targeting from a size perspective. But generally, we're owning companies, taking equity positions in private companies. Um, we tend to focus less on, um, on uh, financials, utilities, uh, energy, right? It's, it's more on sort of the, uh, you know, more the pro-growth type of sectors. And then we're making loans. And I, well, I don't, I don't feel, you know, very passionate about private equity as, as much, although it's been, it's been a great contributor for us. Um, there's just been lots of competition that's, that's flooded into that market. Lots of, lots of other institutional investors are targeting it. So it's return above equities is likely to get squeezed over time. I do think uh, on the income side of the house, there are lots of opportunities uh, to earn a nice income-based return, much, you know, much better than you have in the, in the, in the public markets. You have a, a LIBOR plus five or 6% loan, right? And that's, and that's something that we can just kind of clip, you know, uh, you know, year after year. You're, you're taking credit risk, they're smaller companies, but we don't have anything in, like that that we can invest in, in, the, in, the, in the public side of the house, right? The rates are super low. So that's been very accretive to us. Plus, a lot of legislation pushed the, the regional and community banks out of uh, some of the some of the lending sectors they were active in, and that's been you know that's been filled by institutional investors like BSPRS. Uh, Harry, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, just that uh, uh, I just want to make it clear to everybody: we're you, you and your team are not sitting there going over prospectuses and and offerings and things like that. Uh, we are making these investments through. Uh, seasoned uh, uh, managers, right. or we hire a manager that has a great track record, has a great team, uh, has had consistently good results over the long term, and it's diversified. It yep. is very dangerous buying individual companies. Um, and uh, uh, you better know what you're doing, hiring a good private equity manager you really better know what you're doing. Uh, if you are a private equity manager, it's hard enough for me to manage uh, publicly traded stocks where if I make a mistake, I can sell it tomorrow. Um, in, in, pri in private companies, uh, things happen you can't believe. And, um, and so we're not in the business of picking this particular company and investing in you know 18% uh, of the value of their business. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. Normally what we'll do is we'll identify, uh, think of them as kind of like joint ventures to some extent. We have a partner who's got a specialty with certain types of companies or certain sectors or certain geographies. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll commit a certain amount of money to them. They'll invest that usually ar across uh, 10 to 20 investments. Um, so it's not concentrated to uh, Harry's point. And on the lending side, it, it'll get spread over uh, 30 to 50, uh, you know, different, different individual borrowers. There are there are times when they'll have a, they'll they'll have ex, you know they'll have an investment that requires more equity than they can put in because they have concentration limit issues. And they um, go invest with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's and that that's a very efficient way for us to, um, you know, to to ratchet down our, our fees because they'll say, look, if you want to put in an extra ten million because we can't do it, we won't charge you any fees um, at all, right? And that's you know that's an efficient way to get some exposure, but you still have to be broadly diversified. Um, you know, these, these companies can hit headwinds pretty quick. And, and trust me, we love that part about no fees. The, yeah. uh, that catches our attention because the fees yeah. are significant in this space. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's and to Harry, again to Harry's point. If 
if I have somebody coming to show me a, a company that's based in England, you know, uh, it's a great company, privately held, uh, screaming deal. All I know is that everybody between me and England passed on it. And so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of risk in doing that. So we found it's just better to work with these partners and use them basically as a sourcing engine uh, for the occasional deal that we do do, um, you know, uh, directly. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have just a, a couple of minutes left on the schedule. Terrific. Um, well, I'll just say um, we're trying to get higher returns. We're trying to hold our expenses down. Uh, we're trying to be really careful, um, but we can't do it ourselves. Um, many of our employers, uh, in order to get to a fully funded position, the only way we're going to get there is if some of you take advantage of refinancing your debt at this point. And if you, have, if you have one message that you take away from our presentation today, I hope that will be this money is professionally managed. We're really careful. There are layers of safeguards. And um, uh, I think you can, and this is very different than uh, for a variety of reasons. No, uh, no complaints about what happened historically at PSPRS. They were operating under uh, uh, PBI and other constraints. Uh, this is very different. I think you're gonna get very good returns here. And um, I think that's a great investment for all you employers out there. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I just appreciate everybody attending. Um, the response has been phenomenal. And again, uh, you send any questions to Christian and if we can get to him later, uh, we will. But I appreciate everybody listening. And, and thank you, Harry, for for joining us and um, appreciate your leadership. Christian, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Harry. Uh, we look forward to uh, reconnecting with our audience uh, next Tuesday at 9 a.m.